December 12, uh, 2018. Um, just one quick note that this is uh, exactly five years from the second Wednesday of 2013 when this board was meeting in this space and when the, um, the rain was starting to fall harder and harder as um, that meeting went on. We, at that time, and some of the, uh, I think staff employees, were, their phones were starting to go off with various <laughs> alerts and alarms yeah, about. <laughs> and for those of you who don't know, this building is very close to Boulder Creek, but we, in true spirit of public service, we stayed here <laughs> till the bitter end. And, um, uh, the course of open space for the ensuing five years has been significantly influenced by the events of that day and the next couple of days of the flood. But I think on the whole, um, we're just about out of it and certainly staff deserves an enormous amount of thanks for the extraordinary amount of work over those five years. And there was also a tremendous amount of uh, public volunteerism that went into getting the system uh, back on its feet. So thank you to all. Um, so the first item on the agenda is approval of the minutes. Does anyone have any changes from the minutes? No. 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 I move to approve the minutes. I'll second. Okay. All in favor? Okay. That's unanimous. Okay, the next item is uh, public comment for items not identified for a public hearing. There isn't anything on the agenda tonight for a public hearing. So, Leah, has anyone signed up? Okay, <laughs> then we'll close the opportunity for public comment and move right along to matters from the department. Great, thanks, Tom. Um, I, we have a few things on the agenda and also a, a couple of just informal sort of announcements and updates that I'll make. And I'll, I do wanna just start off by also commenting on the fifth year anniversary of the big floods and uh, also want to uh, extend our sincere thanks to community members who came out and partnered uh, with our staff uh, out on the lands. And uh, and like Tom, like you said, it, it, it wasn't a one week effort. It's It's been going on five years now that we've been putting significant resources to towards that recovery. And uh, we also have done some great work uh, leading up to the anniversary in order to help tell the story of the amount of great work that, uh, uh, that the community came together on. And I just wanna invite uh, Phil Yates up very quickly just to point out uh, where uh, community members uh, could find some of the information that's put together for, uh, that commemorates the uh, anniversary and tells the story. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, I remember that day five years ago, certainly was here, and uh, certainly has affected a lot of us deeply and the community deeply. So we just wanted to recount all of what has occurred and what happened. And if you just go to osmp.org and just scroll down a bit, that's gonna take you just a short video, but you can click on the interactive story map. We'll probably make that link a little bit more obvious. But it's a pretty in-depth and pretty extraordinary map that uh, our GIS staff worked to create. So it'll talk, walk you through a lot of what we did to address the damage. Um, if you scroll down just a bit, I don't need to go through all of this, but I think it's, can you go down to the power of water just a little bit? It really tells a pretty remarkable story. Can you click on the Bluebell drainage link? And so if you have the ability to scroll back and forth, mm. you can really see nature takes its own course. Do you see in the middle, can you, in the middle there's a little bar? Yeah, there you go. Oh, wow. So oh, wow. Clever. <laughs> you can really see the impacts, and I think that really tells a real remarkable story of what <laughs> occurred on the land and some of the <laughs> issues we had to address. Uh, but then you can keep going down for a little further, and you can just scroll. It will talk about some of the maps that shows the damage of what was the significant damage, the severe damage. Uh, and then it just goes through of a map of the volunteer projects, where they occurred, who participated. Uh, if you keep going down, it talks about uh, how we work to restore our natural areas, some of the ag recovery work that we did. Uh, obviously, recovering from the floods was our top priority. But then even more, just the projects. And it's actually kind of cool if you maybe stay here for a second. You can click on some of the spot locations and just see where some of the damage occurred and then what was fixed. 
Mm. So you can really have this experience to see the before and afters of what uh, occurred. And just to get back to all your uh, point too, we couldn't have done any of this without the support of the Boulder community. So we really wanted to document that. And I just want to say thanks too. So I was here for all of that. So it's pretty remarkable and we just wanted to help share that story and we hope you guys will enjoy it and share it with the community members so they can see what, uh, what they did and what we did all together. That's great. great. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks, Phil. All right. Uh, a couple of other updates since we last met um, and, and focusing in on some council actions that have taken place in the past month on, um, on issues that, they, uh, that this board um, uh, wrestled with as well. So in regards to the South Boulder Creek uh, flood detention alternative evaluations that uh, uh, you all wrestled with this summer, uh, council uh, did take that matter up last month and did select variant one 500 year alternative uh, to move forward uh, into preliminary design. Uh, with that, they also asked staff to uh, go back and determine um, if there any, is any upstream uh, detention elements that could be incorporated into the variant one 500 year option. And with that, staff has done some initial analysis uh, and will be uh, going in front of council um, at, on September 20th about some various um, options that they have looked at at a, at a very quick, uh, you know, a quick, quick turnaround time um, in terms of how upstream detention can be incorporated into the variant one. And I believe there will be three options that, uh, uh, that will be presented uh, to the council. Um, all three have various pros and cons associated with them. Uh, so I invite you to, uh, you know, look at the uh, memo that will be coming out uh, uh, pretty quickly uh, on that, and uh, and I'll uh, provide another update uh, uh, next month on on some of what came out of of that particular meeting. Of course, uh, OSMP staff um, has been keeping close tabs on this um, um, and continues to monitor the situation very closely. Um, and uh, the other thing that should be noted that uh, in the passing of the council mem uh, motion, uh, many of the OSBT recommendations did not get incorporated into that motion. Um, so, but there is a, uh, uh, you know, sort of an understanding with the utility staff that they will work closely with staff. Staff will come back, keep this body updated um, um, as, as things move along. Uh, so, um, September 20th is the next date that council is going to be getting some updates on that project. Last night, uh, uh, council had a study session on the 2019 budget, both the operating and CIP budget. Uh, there really was just one or two uh, high level questions for OSMP. Um, otherwise, it, uh, it, uh, most of the, the majority of all the questions were not directed uh, towards us. Uh, so, um, that's that update. Uh, and to regard to the uh, Prairie Dog Working Group, uh, we're gonna be revisiting some of that tonight. Uh, the council was originally scheduled to uh, receive the report and comment on the report on October 2nd. That has been pushed back and they are now gonna be looking at that item on October 16th. Um, so, by, uh, so I probably, well, I will not have an update for you on what council's uh, uh, reaction to the report was, uh, but it does give us some time to further incorporate anything we come up with tonight to uh, add to uh, the memo that would be delivered to them. And uh, one other item that I don't know if I've updated this board yet on, but on October 9th, there's going to be a study session regarding the 23 acre Hogan Pancost property that is located uh, next to adjacent to the East Boulder Rec Center. That's a piece of undeveloped property that uh, the city recently acquired. Um, and uh, the council is very interested in, in determining what its uh, future potential use uh, would be. And so uh, a number of city departments are involved in crafting uh, a memo in order to help guide discussion uh, for that study session. And uh, uh, John Potter led a group of our staff and doing an evaluation of what are the agricultural and ecological um, attributes um, of that property. And uh, we will be providing that information um, uh, as part of that study session. Uh, uh, just, just as a, a sneak preview, uh, uh, just like the previous evaluations we've done of the property over the years, we feel like both its agricultural and ecological um, 
elements are of low priority uh, compared to uh, other priorities and other uh, properties uh, uh, either on our system or that we've evaluated as a high priority and uh, over the recent years. So um, I will keep you uh, up to date on what the next step would be. The study session is not a time for them to make any decisions, but we might get a feel for where that might be heading and if there is any open space uh, implications or involvement that's being asked of us, uh, we will of course bring that back to you. Dan, as I recall, at one point council asked the department whether we had an interest in that property is that right there was a study session i believe in the winter uh, yeah. uh very similar to the, the study session that would be held and i believe that was before the acquisition took place of uh you know what are the potential uses of this other than a full development which was being proposed what else could be done on this property and at that time we put together a report basically saying Due in our internal staff analysis, we felt it had a low priority uh, for uh, uh, open space charter purposes. Uh, we did identify a three acre site that's on the east side of 55th that actually has a 75 foot common boundary with open space. Mm -hmm. And it's more of a wetland area that we felt that that's the highest potential open space value of the property. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we've, we've provided council with sort of our internal staff assessment before, but we went out again uh, this fall and uh, maybe put together a little bit more of a robust um, um, evaluation. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And finally, uh, Lippincott, um, uh, the Jefferson County Board of Commissioners is due, which would be the last sort of uh, decision-making body to look at the Lippincott um, uh, potential acquisition pro uh, property and they are set to consider the acquisition on the 18th of this month. So if that goes ahead with approval, uh, then we'll probably be looking at an October uh, closing date. So, Any questions on sort of informal <coughs> matters from the staff? If not, we'll move uh, into uh, agenda item A, which is the Open Space at Mountain Parks Master Plan Update. And with that, I'll invite Mark Gershman and Mark Davison up to work us through that item. Well, it's been a little bit uh, since we've talked to some members of the board about the, uh, the master plan. We were fortunate enough to have uh, the focus area conversation and recommendations to, uh, to council, which then left us with the focus areas. And since then, we've been updating the process committee, but we haven't had that much time um, in, front of, uh, in front of the board. Fortunately, the process committee updates each month that the board meetings have provided some information about where we're going. But we thought now would be a good time um, as we're entering this next phase of the project and our third um, engagement window at the community to uh, just check in and let you know a little bit about where we're going and, and what our plans are and what the process is for moving forward. I think I turned it off on accident. Oh, okay. Thanks. I think we're good to go. Um, just uh, to set us up in terms of where we are in the timeline, um, we're in that near that green box there where it says uh, strategies and priorities. So the phase we're currently in, uh, the objective of our work will be to uh, end this phase with preliminary or draft strategies going into uh, for, for each of the focus areas. And so um, this, this will include not only a, a bunch of staff work, some of which I'll describe to you, uh, but also a pretty robust engagement with the community. We'll provide more details on that. But um, this uh, window will start with the development of these uh, strategies and then we'll go into the early part of next year um, when we refine uh, those strategies and do some prioritization of that. Um, as we've been moving forward with the plan, again, our goal is to, to take, um, take our focus areas and the associated related topics for those focus areas and transform uh, the information we've got thus far into strategies. Uh, in doing that, some of the things that we've learned, uh, we had a all-staff summit um, at the beginning of August, 
And uh, at that time, it really provided us an, an opportunity to test out what kind of conversations um, would make sense to have around strategy development. And as you might recall, we had up to 13 different related topics for some of our focus areas. One thing that we found was that was a lot to ask of people, <laughs> even of practitioners, um, to kind of cast their, um, their minds out across that breadth of information and, and that many categories. So we've done a, a lot of work, and I want to give a lot of recognition to the core team leads for each of the focus areas and consolidating the related topics. We're down to between three and six for each of the focus areas now. And I'll give you an example of one for the upcoming focus area of ecological health and resilience in just a sec. Um, we also recognize that having conversations um, about outcome, about um, specific strategies, the how we're going to go about doing things, was also uh, maybe a little bit premature. Um, we involved the junior rangers and the junior ranger naturalists in our work with, um, with staff during our all staff summit on strategy development. And, and one of the things that we found out from uh, growing up older folks who have helped us work with, uh, with youth is that um, sometimes that's going a little bit too far into detail and, and maybe even for the broader community. Uh, at the same time, there are some observations by Dan and, and others that it might be useful if we identify outcomes first. What is it you'd like to see the universe look like or open space look like before we go talking about the particular actions that we'd go about doing it? Even though we've got a lot of people in Boulder who are really smart, some people who work for various federal agencies doing land management, um, or a lot of people who spend time on open space thinking a lot about open space and how it could be better or what it is they like about it, most people don't know a lot about the practices of land management. And having questions for them about what is it you'd like to experience on open space, what are your aspirations for what the situation would be like, are important foundational questions to move us into the ability of talking about, okay, then how are we going to get there? And so that was another uh, important kind of innovation uh, that came out of our, our staff summit. <coughs> um, along with that work, something that we knew we were gonna have to do was uh, summarize our current approaches to um, various kinds of service delivery around these focus areas, and then working with our consultant team, we've also identified best practices from other agencies so that we would have information um, about other things that we might try that we're not currently uh, engaged in new approaches. And, and initially we had 13 documents with this information and they were up to, they were fairly length lengthy. So we also took the approach of summarizing it to make it a little bit more accessible and understandable. So uh, to just to jump back quickly to the consolidation of, of related topics, we originally had um, somewhere near 13 or 14 um, related topics for ecological health and resilience, thanks to the work uh, largely um, of the core team and the leadership of Brian and, and Heather, Brian Anaker and Heather Swanson. These have been combined and reduced down to these five that you see before you. And these are going to be the related topics that form the basis of the conversation um, for the community workshop on October 1st. We'll talk a little bit more on that. So I, just again, to give you an idea that we we're able to collapse those 13 or so topics into these, actually one ended up going under financial sustainability, one of the related topics that had to do with um, ecosystem services. So we'll probably pick up that conversation a little bit later down the line. Now you've seen this uh, diagram before, but just wanted to again um, <clears throat> indicate that while this is still our intention and still the outcome for um, this, this phase of our work is to come out with some draft strategies um, for each focus areas, the related topics um, are, are tools to help us get there, tools for the public to kind of get their arms around what is the nature of the components of this focus area, what are the things that are a little bit more meaningful or more specific, and then these outcomes to just a helpful way of um, eliciting from the public information about uh, what it is they'd like to see. And for some people that may be as far as they can go. And they either trust us to come up with the appropriate on the ground actions, policies, plans, programs, <coughs> projects to get that stuff done, 
um, and we rely upon uh, input from others as well to do that. So in addition to that kind of general um, approach to moving forward, um, just wanted to share uh, with you uh, our goals and, and our ideas about the process. Um, so again, our intention around community engagement is for staff and community members, or en around engagement, I guess I should say, is for staff and the community um, to share their ideas. Um, about the related topics, share with us uh, what they think uh, would represent successful outcomes uh, for open space and mountain parks, and help us identify the strategies that over the next decade will make sense to implement to bring about those outcomes. We're gonna, try, we're gonna do that through a process of um, engagement at three community workshops uh, this fall uh, and into the winter and uh, providing uh, options for people who uh, can attend or it's not convenient to attend the community workshops, um, opportunities to engage online. We'll also be um, targeting um, specific populations through some micro-engagement, which I'll have some details on in, in just a sec. Um, Wanted also to, to share with you that we've, um, and I should say the core team leads, um, and, and specifically Brian and, and Heather, have been extremely active in developing um, topic snapshots. So taking those um, 25 or plus page backgrounders that we had on each of the 13 or 14 related topics and compressing those into two to four or five, six page um, snapshots that um, provide context and importance for the particular topic, um, our draft outcomes, so we kind of want to seed the conversation. We got some very strong recommendations from the process committee. Don't hide the ball, move forward, tell them what's up, um, tell them what your thoughts are, your uh, technical expertise, that of the consultants is really valuable to get the ball rolling. Talk about some of the approaches that have worked for you and summarize new approaches or best practices from other agencies. And so that's uh, generally what the topics snapshots will occur. And we've got those prepared. We have those prepared for each of the focus air, uh, for each of the related topics um, for ecological health and resilience. And uh, we're developing them for the other focus areas. Um, at the workshops, and then we'll also make this information available online. We'll have posters um, that summarize um, our existing strategies, also present some of the relevant data and trends, best practices information. We'll have relevant plans and other documentation available for the public, um, both online and at the workshops. So as people come to the related topics stations, they'll have the opportunity to see this material and to share, um, share their ideas about what could be added, what could be changed. Um, other ideas that they might have. And we still do have those backgrounders um, and they will be available should anybody want to dive that deep because there are people in the community who will want to. <laughs> so this is a, a summary of the uh, general event timeline. Um, we're continuing our process of bringing in technical information from the consultant team and staff blending that technical information uh, with community input, which sometimes is technical in nature, but is often um, more around people's uh, desires and hopes and aspirations for what they'd like open space to be about and a little less technical. Um, and then we'll have opportunities to check in with the Open Space Board of Trustees with you um, after each one of these um, public or community workshops. Um, our first um, all staff will be next Wednesday. Um, followed by the community workshop on October 1st. And we did make a slight change. Rather than coming to you just nine or so days later uh, to be in study session, um, with the kind of general approval of the uh, process committee and with just from the standpoint of wanting to be able to have some time with this information um, to, to be able to actually prepare a study session memo for you. We're, we're gonna push the uh, engagement around study session with the board to the following month. So you can see that now this engagement window will extend into January and we won't have um, a master plan focus at the October um, open space board meeting next month. Um, just to give you a little feel for what things will look like, obviously we'll be in a couple of different, we'll be in two different venues, the Avalon Ballroom and the Boulder Jewish Community Center. 
but generally um, we're going to have a presentation um, after folks have an opportunity to sign in and, and kind of wander around. Um, we're hopeful that we'll each each time have either a member of the board uh, pr from the process committee typically or council there um, to welcome folks. Um, we'll have staff welcoming folks as well. Then the consultants uh, will lead a presentation about the particular focus area um, and related topics and we'll do some keypad polling um, around uh, the degree to which uh, these outcomes match the outcomes that people um, would like to see and the degree to which the approaches that we've identified would deliver on those outcomes. Just to get a general sense of where we stand and for people to see through keypad polling, they'll see the results presented on the screen in front of them, um, see where the rest of the folks who are attending the workshop stand. So it's an opportunity for people to be uh, interactive uh, with some of that information. Then there'll be the opportunity for folks to go and explore the various uh, information stations which represent the related topics to provide us with their specific recommendations that we can't really do through keypad polling about the kinds of adjustments or changes or new outcomes or new uh, related topics that they think should be explored that we may not have uh, captured. Um, so that's the general approach there. Anything else thing? In addition, we'll have online engagement. So um, starting about next week, we'll put on um, on the open space and Mountain Parks webpage for the master plan, some general um, input questions. These are questions for people who may attend um, none of the workshops, uh, who may not want to spend any more time um, dealing with in-depth questionnaires, who just want to say, hey, this is what I have to say about strategy development. We're going to describe the idea of outcomes and approaches or strategies, and then give people a pretty much open-ended opportunity <coughs> to share their thoughts. We've done this throughout um, the master planning process, and we've typically got, had some folks that that was the way that they most like to engage, and we've received some information that's typically matched up pretty well with what we've seen down the line, too. So it, it's a good way for people to feel included at their um, level of interest, so matching level of interest with an easy way to get involved. But as we move into the specific focus area conversations at the community workshops, We'll be adding the additional information, the links to the workshop resources, the topic snapshot posters, as well as um, having some specific questions uh, that match those from the keypad polling and also give people the opportunity to provide the open-ended um, feedback on our outcomes, related topics, and strategies. And those will happen concurrent with the uh, public process for the other focus areas. As I mentioned earlier, we're also going to engage with certain members of the community who we don't typically do great job with, with open houses or online engagements. So we'll be working uh, with the Promotoris model with the Latino community, um, focusing in on a subset of the related topics and doing some, uh, building a focus group uh, with the community and, um, and reaching out and providing feedback that way. We're working with Growing Up Boulder and the Youth Advisor, Youth Opportunities Advisory Board um, to provide us uh, feedback from youth in the community. I think you've heard them talk and speak before you, so you know how articulate and helpful that can be. Uh, we'll also be doing outreach to people experiencing disabilities um, through our general programming of the department and um, looking for other opportunities with other populations as they arise uh, to take advantage of those. So that's uh, kind of the flavors of engagement. As I mentioned before, you know, we're continuing this process of community engagement, building technical content, um, trying to, to weave this uh, fabric together so that in the end we've got something that respects what the community is interested in and is technically robust and technically informed. Again, for our current window of engagement and for the current phase of the project is that we're looking to come out with a set of draft strategies at the end of this window. Following this, um, this part of our engagement, um, we'll be moving into um, further refinement of the strategies and some prioritization and trade-offs in accordance with some of our financial models, where a lot of trade-offs happen, is looking at the available resources to make things happen on the ground. Um, and that will happen in, in early 2019, just as a, a little glimpse forward with, um, with where we're going. 
Well, that's about um, all that I had to say. Mark, I didn't know if there was stuff that you wanted to add at this point. <coughs> no, this was a great summary. We just wanted to open up for any questions you might have. I seem to remember in our process committee, did we talk about it, maybe at this meeting you guys were going to provide us an example or two of either the big memos or the little memos? I've, I forget which, which it was. Are we at that point yet where we can just sort of get a sense of the amount of information you're trying to uh, shape and we communicate? We just distributed today internally the topic snapshots of in preparation for the all staff meeting to give people a chance to review that. Yeah. So that's certainly information that we could uh, make make available more publicly. Right now, I think what we're trying to do is use the um, all staff meeting um, as uh, an opportunity test, to pre test, to, uh, test this, these materials and to tweak them in response to that before we release them. But I mean, there's nothing, we're just going to make them better as a result yeah. of that. So if, if that's something that the board would like to see, I don't see anything. Yeah, I think, you know, Kurt, we're trying to protect staff time in terms of making sure everything works in sequence. So, I mean, we could bring them, for example, to the process committee as examples. But really, the goal is to set them up for the all staff workshop. Well, I think it just, even if it was just a couple, it might give the board a sense of what you're trying to accomplish with these things. I mean, it's a pretty difficult task. And so, anyway. We can deliver on yeah. that. Right? Yeah. Um, I had a, a question, well, a comment and a question related to the, um, the outcomes approach. <coughs> Um, I'm, I'm in full agreement that your way person can speak to outcomes but not to strategies as strongly. And so I, I think that that's an excellent way to get the community participating in a way that they're comfortable. So thank you for coming up with that approach. Now, um, uh, you spoke, Mark, about how the, the process committee said, hey, can you come up with some draft outcomes staff? And so I, w I would like to know if you've been using any other sources of input at this point in the process with the drafting of outcomes. Um, are you going back to the statistically valid surveys, um, wordles generated by the community, you know, er the earlier engagement stuff, is that also informing the development of these draft outcomes? Mm. I'd, say, I'd say yes to all of that. Yeah. In addition, we do have a number of board and council approved plans that describe outcomes associated with the various focus areas mm -hmm. that we've been working on. So we've used a number of different sources of information to, uh, to kind of position ourselves in a, in a kind of safe way, I'd say, you know, with the outcomes, because these are our attempts to seed the conversation. And then if, um, you know, I think that there, there could be uh, opportunities for a little bit more probing or, or edgy things, where we we have some selected selected topics where we're we're going to be exploring. Well, maybe we should go a little bit further than than we have before. Okay. So uh, in the um, in the keypad polling, we've kind of reserved the opportunity to go a little bit even beyond where we have documented direction or strong inference from the materials that we've collected. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, it is a good question, Andrea. We've definitely made sure, uh, kind of, uh, you know, typically in that first focus area, we're looking for the higher level, the values and how they're turned into focus areas, but we did collect information that dive deeper because folks like to talk about outcomes. Oh, and, yeah, definitely. And then staff like, have the plans. Um, the thing that, the way it's set up is folks can, like, affirm an outcome, excellent, you know, that looks good. They can say, well, that looks good, but it needs refinement. Or they can say, hey, you're missing something here. So we're, we're definitely making sure that there's ways to affirm what we've got, change things, and then say what's missing, what's an emerging trend or a gap that you don't have. Mm. Okay. And I'll, <clears throat> I'll just add that <clears throat> it's certainly an opportunity to hear about people's suggestion for strategies too. Mm -hmm. Even though we feel like uh, talking about outcomes is a little bit more accessible for those that mm -hmm. are prepared to talk about strategies, this this would be the time that we want to hear from that too. So mm -hmm. it's not precluding that. It's oh, yeah. uh, we're just adding on the additional item of thinking about outcomes. Understood. I don't know how we're Go doing ahead. this. <laughs> um, I fully agree on your paring down the related topics. Thanks. I think four or five is about the right number to deal with. 
Um, my question is how you got from umpteen related topics down to the four or five. Was it a matter of, of lumping and including all of those, or did you actually delete some, and on what basis? And can you give us some examples of how that was done? I can do that, or Brian and, and nice. is here, and he can uh, and speak to that, because he led that effort. Good evening. Um, a good example of that is we had a related topic for fire, a second one for flood, and a third one for drought. Each of those you could talk for an hour with somebody about. Um, but we thought that we could combine and consolidate them all as ecological disturbance. And so that's what we did, understanding that we're trading off the ability to do a deep dive on all three of those. And so in the materials we'll present at the workshop, it's a little heavy on the wildfire piece. Um, but that's an example of going from three to one. And so that's largely the approach we took. Ecosystem services was another one that we jettisoned forward or push forward to the financial work we're going to be doing in 2019. It's, is it also fair to say, Brian, you left a, a breadcrumb trail back to the original related topics so anyone can track back where they came from? And yeah. should we, similar to like missing ag in a focus area, we brought you guys and a bunch of folk yeah. brought that forward to be a focus area. Yeah. So there's the option to bring something if we missed anything. Yeah, is that yeah we've done a careful crosswalking of how did we get from 13 to, to where we're at today? Can you say just a little bit more about your thinking about moving ecosystem services to financial? Yeah, so as we started to explore that, to develop a snapshot for and think about what data we would have to bring to the table, what that conversation would look like, um, we realized the ecosystem services is typically viewed through uh, a value, a valuing of um, the services ecosystems provide to humans and typically done through financial terms in terms of uh, how much is a tree worth, how much is a blade of grass worth, how much is the clean air and the water filtration that you're getting worth. And so we kept kind of landing on that realization that it was all about um, dollars and so that seemed like the connection there in terms of uh, putting it into the eco economic piece. And then the other was that we just didn't have much to bring to show because we hadn't done any of that as a department to date. And so, you know, it was more of a conversation like you would do for scenario planning is mm -hmm. what do different futures look like? Um, what if, how do you describe ecosystem services? How do you put dollar amounts onto things? What are the opportunities um, that might lie there in our department uh, exploring that as an option? Thank you. I don't know if others have more to add, but it does raise a question about the use of scenario planning as sort of a model in this assessment. I mean, do you see the concepts of scenario planning coming into this public process at all? What? A, I mean, this is a lot of ways to do scenario planning, but I mean, it is pretty widely. And we, we've said, you know, it, it's you know. Horses for courses, um, <laughs> you know, it does a horse run in wet weather or dry weather. In other words, we'll apply as we get into it, depending upon the complexity of the strategy, what, what do we need to make it work? It might just be scenarios or it could be alternatives. It could be saying this one's fairly straightforward or it's a, re it's a financial, fiscally constrained division. So I think as we get into that next phase, we'll be starting to really apply that, which, you know, comes about in January once the strategies are defined and that allows us to look at them. And some of them, as we spoke about, some strategies might be saying, here's the planning we need to do post master plan to make this work, but the really complex ones that need more information or more research or more analysis. So we're leaving our options open as we get into that. Okay. Um, I had a couple questions. One is, could you elaborate a bit on the anticipated timeline of, um, on the, uh, on the financial sustainability piece of this. We have a study session at some point in the spring, and then in the summer uh, is when the draft plan comes out. I, I'm not asking like, you know, by the week or anything, but I'm interested in your sense of what the, you know, how those two things occur in relationship to each other, because that's, you know, where the schedule is probably gonna start to get pretty tight. 
and get a sense of when, but maybe from your perspective, it's always been that way. <laughs> <laughs> but very tight. We've had the, the luxury of having you writing all these memos. Yeah. Um, but, you know, sort of your sense of, you know, when would we take up that study session um, and how many months is that in advance of when the draft plan would come out? One of, one of the things that we, we do know because of that exact thing that you've identified, Tom, is that even on the heels of the first workshop, once we've completed that and the first conversation with the board, um, we've already talked to Brian and Heather about the importance of now trying to identify and put some financial numbers to the strategies that seem to be gelling as the most likely to be advanced so that we can be ready. So we're not waiting, okay, we'll wait till we get through all the focus areas and then start the cost estimating uh, to build our financial scenario models uh, for um, the next phase. So that's going to start kind of on the heels of our conversations with the community staff and the board. Once we've completed the work and have a set of draft strategies, then we will have be we will have the information about what we think it would cost to develop these in fiscally constrained action plan and vision plan level scenarios the statistically valid survey will be useful for giving us information about trade-offs we'll have uh, exercise by which people can allocate a round number, $100 or something like that, amongst uh, a number of um, outcomes or priorities within the system, and that will help us inform, you know, how we might develop some recommended, um, uh, recommended financial scenarios for each of the each of the scenarios that we've got. Yeah, and just as a sort of procedural item, typical to the way we've done the focus areas and other strategies, will be coming to the process committee in probably November and then bringing it up to the board around about December to show, you know, what's the next steps for this final phase of the master plan, well, the final two phases, the finalization of the strategies as Mark's described, and then there's the actual development of the draft plan, isn't there? in looking at the plan. So those we've really got to come to the process committee with that and explain it in detail to you and then bring it to the board. We have, you know, a, a, it's sort of in that uh, orange box is kind of the draft plan development because once we have our set of uh, financial scenarios associated with with our strategies, that, that really is the, the draft plan. Well, and so we'll have engagement to get us to those scenarios and then a presentation of that information. Yeah, I was just sort of building off of that. The orange box begins sort of mid uh, in the first quarter of 2019, but our study session on the finance piece of it, I would imagine is February, March of 2019. March, April, yeah. Okay, March, April. Well, even more so then. Yeah. That means that we're not even doing the, the study session piece of it until pretty deep in it. And maybe that's just the way it is, but um, that's fairly well into the process, or put it the other way around, fairly close to when the draft plan is going to have to be done if we're going to hit the other benchmarks. And I just want to sort of a sense of, you know, kind of what that window looks like and whether we're being realistic and thinking about how that's going to work. I, you know, we, and sorry, may I ask please, Karen. a similar kind of question? Um, and when you expect to have the statistically valid survey results back? Because to me, those two pieces need to come together. And yeah, no, we, we absolutely agree with everything you're saying. And our goal is to get, you know, by November, have all of that in place and lined up. I mean, we've got the general outline, but we're working with a consultant to tee up the details of that, looking at, you know, and we'll be bringing, for instance, potential alternatives for the types of statistical surveys we can do, et cetera. So if you can, you know, basically give us a couple of months as we do the background work to get that all lined up and we'll let you know, as we do with the process committee, hey, if we do it this way, this could extend the master plan out to this date. If we do it this way, we can deliver it on time. So we're happy to let, as we've done before, the process committee know the resources and schedule that could shift depending upon what we need to do to finalize the plan. So for these workshops, um, it would be useful, among many things, to have the public in some ways presented with outcomes in this domain, 
that range across minimal investment to maximal investment, because then that's going to go into your work down the line when you create your sort of multivariate scenarios and you do your statistically valid survey. Are you thinking about that as you put together these options of possible outcomes? To, I mean, I just think it would be nice if there was sort of bracketing at a minimum. I mean, there can be other outcomes, but at a minimum to bracket the range of investments that might be possible. Um, so just a thought. To some degree, we're doing that uh, at the outcome level. Okay. In other instances, it's probably going to be kind of the intensity or volume of the implementation of various strategies or, or approaches to, to achieve that outcome and, and how far we want to take it. Um, and right. I think that, that provides a little bit more flexibility um, for us in terms of getting uh, a, a kind of a community pulse on on, on outcomes. If we hear from the community, though, that they want to see something, um, you know, with a lot of vigor and a lot of enthusiasm in a particular way, that that will probably be one of the ways that we'll know if that's something that, you know, we'll want to amp up or provide uh, a conversation at the study session for that focus area saying, hey, there seems to be a lot of interest around this. Here are some implications of what that would mean for related topics and how we might go about doing that. And in some ways, so sorry, you could. Well, I just see some value in sort of grounding the discussion by saying, look, for, for this resource that we're talking about, this would be an outcome associated with a substantial investment in this area. I think it just helps anchor people in what might be possible. They can always come back and say, but the outcome I want is way past, that's fine. But anyway, just as you're thinking that through to sort of bracket people's thinking might be, might be helpful. Okay. I thought it would be useful to, if you um, could sort of elaborate on your expectations uh, of us for the study sessions. And in particular, the, you know, some study sessions are really about to sort of we listen and learn, ask questions, maybe offer some opinions on stuff, but it's very much a truly a study process. There are some where, you know, it's all but voting. There may even be sort of thumbs up. It's, you're expected to have a decided point of view on the various questions that come up. And of course, there's all kinds that sort of fall in between. And every so often you think you're going to have one kind of study session and get surprised that it's really more of the other. And I think in this case, it's probably, you know, it's two months out, but worth being fairly clear about your expectations, and, in, and more particularly, if the expectation is that people, you know, trustees will have, you know, reasonably formed views on is a particular strategy the, the right one, the wrong one, or, you know, perhaps somewhere in between and just needs to be tweaked, it's, you know, kind of worth being clear about that, that if you're going to say, oh, okay, well, you know, we need thumbs up on this, or is it, you know, your vision can be something a little you know, more study-like and a little less voting-like. Well, that's a, that's. I, it does help us in our own preparations to know, all right, am I essentially going to be voting at the study session? I, I think one of the things that we want to accomplish at the study session is is that study piece of saying, okay, here, here's what we know about this focus area, these related topics, and the suite of outcomes and strategies that we've heard about. Um, in some cases, we may hear a whole lot from the community about new ideas that weren't included in our preparatory materials. In other cases, we may hear less of that. And so we just want to make sure that we have a place where we can put that stuff together and hear if there's anything additional or any nuances from the board that they'd like to add to the mix so that we have the full, um, if you will, set of ingredients as we move forward to develop a set of recommended um, strategies or draft strategies for the plan. So that's, that's one thing. We also may find that there's some trending um, topics that come out of the conversations that we have with the community at the workshops or through the online engagement uh, that we want to say this seems to be um, uh, there's a lot of motion on this and or interest on this in the community. This seems to be maybe one of the more thematic elements over the next six to ten years for open space mm -hmm. and get um, some uh, feedback uh, from the board on those kinds of things. So that 
we don't have a whole lot of time between the engagement of, for each of these focus areas closing and coming to, even though it's the next month, that we have, you know, we still don't have a huge amount of time to pull together. So those kinds of commitments are probably where we're going. Mark, maybe. No, I, I think more. I could reiterate what you said that it, it would be nice to get some sort of a sense of a thumbs up, as it were, because if you think about it, once we go into the statistical survey, we don't want to be redoing that because we came up with 20 extra strategies later <laughs> or replaced 10. So the, the earlier we can get a sense of these are looking good, these are the one or two you need to do a lot more work on or a little bit of tweaking. So give us a sense of the work you think they need, which was so good in the focus areas when you give us that feedback. And is there anything we've missed? That's a clear one at the study session that popped up. You've either heard something from the public or something's emerged via staff. So really, yeah, the closer we can get to finalizing the strategies earlier, the better. Okay, thanks. That's may I, may I extend that question yeah. um, to the role of the board with respect to the community workshops? Mm. I mean, I, I've marked on my calendar the dates for those, and right. I'm wondering if if we're expected to go to those or if people have time and are, are planning on going to those, what Absolutely. that expectation and role is, because it seems to me that will feed into what you were just talking about at, about the study session. If we've all been to them, we don't need to hear a lot of reports about what happened at the community workshops. We can delve into the analysis and Abs where we're headed. Yeah, on. absolutely, Karen. I mean, it's if, you know, I know it's a lot of time for the board, but if you're able to attend them and frankly have that free roaming role to be able to go around the stations and hear directly from the public, it, it's great. And we've publicly noticed them so all the board can turn up mm. for all workshops. We had a lot of very positive feedback from the community after the open house uh, for the, the values development right. phase of the plan, uh, having council and board members there. That, that really helped people feel like their time spent at the meeting was well spent, that the city was taking this seriously. So again, I know it is a lot of time, but we certainly would um, appreciate that if, if you could spend it. I'll make you give a little speech. <laughs> no, no. You, just a little. No, that's the process. <laughs> uh, um, someone asked me yesterday, uh, what time these things were going to be. They said they went on the website and there was no indication of the time. There were dates listed. And I'm wondering if the information that's on slides eight and nine, the event timeline and the presentation stage, um, are going to be posted on the? Yeah. Cover that. Yeah, I think, Phil, do you want to maybe give a little bit of a sense of where we're at with that? Because people are, people are ready for that information based right, on yeah. the feedback I received. So we're going to do a big public release on Tuesday, the 18th. <laughs> so that information is going to be available, and we can certainly work to put some of this information up sooner, Great. the better. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Phil. We're also working to have some of the more, more fundamental information also translated into Spanish. So there's a couple of steps to get all this stuff out on the web and updated. I will say a, a couple of changes. As you know, Darren uh, Wagner, who is the project manager, uh, had, had her child uh, in, in August. And um, Juliet Bunnell, who you may not know as well, but who has really been the brains of the operation, especially since Darren has been away, um, just left. Uh, we'll be leaving tomorrow for a couple of weeks of vacation in Europe. So um, a lot's going on. <laughs> <laughs> You're a busy guy. <laughs> Mark is a busy guy. Well, there's a lot of busy people here. Mm. Are we? Can I have one more? Question? Okay, yeah. Um, could you please explain the keypad polling to me? What are the logistics of this situation? I kind of have this nightmare of like there are two iPads and 500 people, and they're <laughs> trying to put their votes in. So, so the consultants uh, work with uh, Turning Point Technologies, uh, and there'll be a, a 150 or 200. We actually have some at the city. We're not sure they all work together, but we'll have at least 150 or so of these. Um, clickers, uh, oh, similar okay. to what people use nowadays in university classes, college mm -hmm. classes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I never used one, but I've heard <laughs> about them. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and so that won't, it won't be an issue of people having a crowd around. Hopefully every, we'll have enough for everyone who's there um, to have one. And um, there'll be specific questions on the screen where we ask people to um, rank things or identify their top three. 
and then there's kind of an instantaneous mm -hmm. collation of that information and presentation okay. of the results that, that show up on the screen. Similar to that tool that you um, that you emailed us about, mm -hmm. um, Andrea, that allows pe allow people to use their um, smartphones to do. I imagine eventually we'll get to that place where we can load it up by people just waving a magic wand over their, their cell phone. Mm -hmm. But we're not quite ready yeah. for that yet. <laughs> yeah. we, did, we did laugh this morning because we are in our risk scenario at the project management meeting. We went, what happens if there's a power cut? So we do have a plan B, oh, right. <laughs> old school paper forms if it all goes wrong. We so could raise hands, you know. Yeah, yeah. that's true. That's sort of <laughs> instantaneous <laughs> response. The consultant's very, actually it's great. The consultant's an expert in this, so we, we feel pretty confident trusting them to try this out. And frankly, if it doesn't work, we can go back to old school. You know, it's just fun to try it out and try and get that instant response. Cool. Thanks. It's really engaging with audiences, mm -hmm. though. I think it's a cool idea. Yeah, and we have a couple of fun questions to kick it off to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. People don't feel intimidated by the technology. Mm -hmm. they've, they've done this a lot, and we're looking forward to it. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> And I just, I obviously want to just thank our staff. It's been a heavy lift, and, and I think we might have noted either to the process committee or this board, but we expanded our core team uh, over the last couple of months. For instance, Heather uh, came on to help support uh, this focus area, and so there's been a number of staff people that have come to the forefront quite recently to add capacity and their expertise to, and it's really improved uh, our ability to uh, sort of be where we're at. So thanks to staff. All right, moving on to item B on our agenda, uh, Brian is going to come up again and he'll be talking about our funded research program. Do you have a clicker? Yeah, it's next to Dan. Oh, there you go. Well, thank you for having me here to give you your annual update on OSMP's funded research program. This is the third time I've updated you on this program. Um, and I just wanted to start by acknowledging that I work really closely with Will Keeley on this. And then I kind of bring this program and make sure it runs each year. Uh, so thanks to him and around 15 other staff who help us review the pile of proposals we get in um, each winter. So thanks to staff. So the funded research program began uh, around 20 years ago, 1995. I was a junior in high school. So I wasn't here for that. <laughs> but in their infinite wisdom, they drafted these four goals, which we still um, hold today. First is to provide a way to train scientists and land managers in the region to address the department's short-term and long-term management needs to solidify our relationships with all the strong researchers we know are in the Boulder Valley and beyond, and to start thinking about open space properties as an integral part in the broader Front Range. Mm. So in November of last year, we issued an RFP asking for proposals. We synchronized that call <coughs> with Jefferson County Open Space and Boulder County Parks and Open Space as we did the previous year. So this was our second time trying this. And in total, our department received 21 pr proposals requesting over $300,000. And we chose eight to fund using our budget of $70,000. And I just bolded uh, some of the key words across each of those titles for the ones that we funded to give you a flavor for the diversity of projects. We had one on Apache presence in the Boulder Valley, one on forest vulnerability to climate change, and there you see an asterisk, which means we co-funded that with Boulder County Parks and Open Space. Mm. So Camille approached us and said, hey, it'd be great if I could put plots on your land and Boulder County land, and for these reasons, you have different forest treatment histories. I'd like to look at those communities. Um, and also then you can get a little more budget to do uh, the work. Another one on nutrient deposition from the atmosphere. One on using social media to start to understand scenic resources. One on post-flood restoration, measuring whether or not we're successful, and specifically there in Left Hand Creek. Uh, the second interagency one we funded was on bullfrog management. 
And then two kind of related ones on climate change and grasslands. The first one to set up an experiment to manipulate uh, rainfall patterns and look at grassland recovery, crossing that treatment with grazing treatments and then looking really closely at plant demographics. And the other one looking at a couple key species, uh, big blue stem is one of them, um, to late season water additions and it, its responses. So here's two of them that both used funnels or buckets in their research, which was an interesting emerging theme this year. So Joe Ehrenberger uh, is with Adaptation Environmental Services, proposed to spend three field seasons removing bullfrogs from Boulder County and uh, uh, City of Boulder properties, testing these two techniques. One is this um, bucket trap that you see here, which is submerged in a pond with the lip just above water and some attractant lights at night and the bullfrogs jump in there and they can't get out. So here you can see a pile of bullfrogs in the bottom, which then they would use kill jar to, um, with a euthanasia uh, chemical in it and do donate those frogs to places like the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. So we're excited about that one. And the other bucket project we had was to look at atmospheric nutrient deposition, both from wet um, deposition, which tends to be where your nitrogen comes from, and dry dust deposition, which according to the proposals where you tend to get phosphorus from. So we can start to learn if that's the case, um, how far away from urban centers you need to go before that fingerprint of deposition disappears. What we really liked about this one is that it had an elevational gradient built into it and s some of our properties are there. They've already got one of these set up at Potasso and some other sites further up the hill. So Ruth Heindel's a postdoc at CU um, and so we've got two of these out on open space currently. Then I wanna show you some results in from a previous funded proposal. This one was funded in 2016 um, with a title that only a real geek could love. A spatio-temporal, yeah, where's Kevin? He would really love this proposal title. A spatio-temporal analysis of changes in forest extent in the Northern Front Range. So this hit one of those goals of looking all the way from Denver up to Fort Collins um, and kind of two main components here. One is taking uh, these landscape photos, relocating those four points and taking the photos again. So here you see a early 20th century shot looking down in the auditorium in Sinitas uh, Valley in the background, relatively open fields in the foreground and a pine savanna type grassland mosaic in the background. Uh, and then in 2016, of course, in the foreground, you see the eastern deciduous trees that have planted and spread like box elder and green ash. And then when you look back in the background, you see what was an open savanna or a grassland is really closed. And if you think about Lion's Lair Trail back there, it's, it's a pretty forested kind of experience when you get back there, dense shade, closed canopy pine forest. So really different changes. And the nice thing about this work is that they've mounted these photos and we can then use them both as artwork mm. and for education and outreach to tell this story in a less quantitative way than this. So this is part two where they use the aerial photographs um, to map forest cover in 1938. So green is forested and um, non-green is other. And then to repeat that in 2015. And what you see right away is there's a lot of infilling in forest across this time window. And a quote from Kyle says, forest cover increased 7.8% related to things like fire suppression and recovery from heavy uh, logging and mining activities in the late 1800s. Interestingly though, you see some places where forest was lost and you can see that most clearly in the third panel, the delta where those places in red are the places where there was forest in 1938, but there is no longer forest. And I've just overlain for you some big fire events in the last 15 years that you may be familiar with. You know, in the north, High Park fire outside of Fort Collins in 2012, 90,000 acres. So double the footprint of open space in mountain parks. Down closer to home here, the Four Mile Canyon fire, uh, over 5,000 acres in 2010. So a good proof of concept that the remote sensing and classification algorithms worked. We can detect these uh, known events, um, but also just interesting complexity around how fire suppression has led to both increases in forest and decreases in forest. And the notion here is that as forest stands get dense, 
when, when wildfire finally does come, it tends to be hot, catastrophic, crown fires that are standard placing. And so you get into these big scenarios of land cover change that are difficult to reverse. So we thought that was a good investment and we got a lot of return on uh, the dollars we put in there. Back in, um, oh sorry, first coming soon, next steps, we're about to issue a proposal for funding in um, this November and proposals will be due in January of 2019. So a similar uh, rhythm than we've had in the past. What I'm happy to report is this is now our fifth consecutive year. So we did start in 95, but we had a couple five or seven year periods where we offered no funding. So I think getting these consecutive years of funding gets researchers used mm -hmm. to these coming and they start to think about these project ideas in advance. In fact, we have seen that over the last three years. Um, in particular, some of the same PIs coming back with revised proposals or different tweaks on their proposals. Um, so we're happy to see that and look forward to what we're going to get this year. And then you may remember last spring we had our first ever uh, Front Range Open Space Research Symposium. So this was one of those things that uh, a board member attended and we made him stand up and speak. So Kurt was there, thank you for representing uh, OSBT at this meeting. This was also an interagency initiative from the outset. We uh, co-sponsored it with Jefferson County and Boulder County Parks and Open Space. Uh, sorry, uh, Boulder, yes, that's right. And uh, Open Space hosted it. We hosted it, and this was at SEEK. It was an all-day symposium where people who had won these grants in the past came and gave research talks and did question and answer. It was open to the public. We had over 100 people there. Um, it was a great day, and I think we had a lot of momentum to try it again. So we've pawned it off in 2019 for Jefferson County to take the lead, and we'll be meeting with them next week to start to hash out some of the details for event planning, um, so stay tuned for that. And I think that's all I have. Thank you. Any questions? Um, is, is your granting of um, research grants, would you say limited more by quality or the total amount of money that you have? Um, this year it was limited by money, absolutely. And we had a lot of subsequent conversation around can we find an additional $5,000 or can we move this to a contract so we can change it a little bit and not have it be as much as I go away, do the work and come back with the results. Um, I would say that's been the case all three years that I've been involved, that we can't quite fund everything, but each year it's getting harder and harder to turn away quality proposals. I'd say our funding rate is much higher though than something like the National Science Foundation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're funding eight out of the 20 some, which is much higher proportion than NSF, which is like Although 30%. Although your, your average award is what, roughly? Yeah, it's $5,000 to $10,000. Not a um, lot, but up to getting 15. people and. And the interagency sweetens the pot a little bit and get up to 20 to 30. Yeah. I've also been exploring this notion of multi-year grants. So um, you get 10 one year and 10 another year, so you can spread the project out over time. Get a, progress report in year one and then continue into year two. And we have dappled uh, with those in the past, but getting a little more explicit about it. But we've also looked at going the, the other way, which is in micro grant direction, maybe connecting into junior rangers where if we've got junior rangers who are really, you know, approach them as we're onboarding and say, look, here's this option. If you see a research idea, you might be able to win a grant for $500 to and we'll give you two weeks at the end of your summer to go to work on this and write a report for us. And another option right along those lines is we give you a certain amount of money to go work on a grant that we're also giving to a, a PI so they don't, you know, either one is valuable. Yeah, that's a great idea, I hadn't thought of that. Well, thanks, Brian. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Great. Very cool. Oh, on your handouts on the back side are all the abstracts if you want to read them oh, later. Excellent. Enjoy. Thanks, Brian. Um, moving on to agenda item C, uh, mule deer study. Um, and uh, Heather will lead us, but first I think, John, you want to? 
Dan, if I could jump in for a second and take a cue from some of Brian's uh, slides there, just to mention uh, another collaborative effort that some of our staff, uh, as well as Karen Hallwig, have been working on uh, to look at forest health uh, across the front range in the area. And we've, um, and Chris Warner in particular, our forest ecologist, has been uh, working on a collaborative project with uh, CU, CSU, and Boulder County, and they are hosting a series of um, very interesting field trips and a workshop that are open to the public, and so I wanted to mention that. The f um, and Karen uh, can add to this if there's anything I'm missing. So the, um, the first field tour is September 22nd, and I understand that that is quickly filling up. So if anyone is interested in going on this wonderful look at some of the forest management that we have done on city lands, that would be a great opportunity to do that. The second uh, works, the workshop, the second installment in the three-part series is a workshop at SEEK uh, being held on September 26th. And then uh, the third item is another field tour, and I believe that's on, uh, looking at county land management in, in, in the um, foothills, and that is on September September 29th. So I just wanted to invite everyone to um, think about attending one of those and learning more about forest health and what's coming in our, our forest management. Um, the If you want more information, please uh, feel free to speak with me or with Karen or search on uh, what would be the best thing? I guess, um, I think it's, is it the center? An event bright. Eventbrite, okay, great. And uh, so anyways, that's um, other sorts of investigation and collaborative research that we're doing, and do you have a question? Well, I just, this is different than the workshops and tours that are gonna happen on urban forest fire interface issues. That's not part of this. Well, I don't know about another event, but that is part of this. Oh, yes. That's what I yeah. thought. I just wasn't yeah. sure. I, I mean, it seemed like one of them was really focused on forest management for fire management and what you can do to help out, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, that, okay. that's right, Kurt. It, yep. I've got the same one. Yep. Thank you. Uh, and I'll also take this opportunity uh, before Heather Swanson, our senior wildlife ecologist, comes up to just kind of provide a little context in that we have this great funded research program that uh, that Brian just described for you, where we're, uh, we're essentially giving grants to have great research done that helps us as land managers do a better job. But we also uh, do quite a bit of research in-house, and um, the, the uh, presentation that Heather's gonna share with you next Next is an example of that, where uh, we are going out and seeking grants and partners to to answer questions that we have uh, directly as land managers, and so it kind of gives you a nice spectrum and uh, to see the range of types of research that we do. So now um, Heather will come up and talk about this uh, project that she's been working on. Hi. So you may remember we talked last, I think it was a long time ago, about the fact that we were going to do this study. Um, so we now are getting very close to actually getting on the ground. So I wanted to come back and give you some of the details about what exactly we're gonna be doing. And um, like both Dan and John said, this is a collaborative study with Colorado Parks and Wildlife. So again, we're sort of looking at our foothills ecosystems. and. People see deer all the time, so they sort of think, what's, what's cool about deer? I see them all the time. Um, but really, mule deer are our primary large herbivore in a lot of our open space foothills ecosystems. We certainly do have elk, but they tend to be more on the peripheries of our open space, um, out a little bit further from town. So in most of our close into town open space, mule deer are really our large herbivores, with the exception of, obviously, um, livestock. And then their primary predator is mountain lions, and people are very interested in mountain lions. Um, the CPW study looking at mountain lions showed that we have a very healthy lion population, despite the the fact that they're rarely seen. So these really are two species that we're very interested in and that probably are driving a lot of what we see going on naturally in these foothills ecosystems. 
So there was previous research done on the deer herd in this area. Um, in the 1980s, there were several population surveys done. That seemed to be a very high point in deer populations. There was a lot of conflict with deer and people, so it was kind of a hot topic at that time. So they did some surveys then. And back in 2005, we undertook a collaborative study with Colorado, at the time, Colorado Division of Wildlife, um, now Colorado Parks and Wildlife, to look at um, chronic wasting disease in the deer. And then in 2008 to 2016, um, hopefully some of you have had a chance to see Matt Aldrich present his research on mountain lions. That was a much wider study area, um, but open space was one of the sort of core areas of that study. So we have a lot better understanding of our lion populations. And when we looked back in 2005 to 2008, we found one of the highest prevalences of CWD that's been found. Um, we found that males had an average prevalence of about 41% and about 20% of females were infected. So overall, the average prevalence was about 28%, which is extremely high. We also looked at survivorship of the deer, and we found that uninfected deer lived an average of 5.2 years after they had been captured, whereas infected deer lived only 1.6 years. So CWD was having an intense impact on their survivorship. So CWD seemed to add to other mortality causes um, that we would otherwise see, other types of sickness or injuries, vehicle collisions, other things that can happen to deer. Um, but we also found that mountain lions most definitely select and kill CWD-infected deer um, preferentially. And so looking at our population, when we did our census in 2005 through 2008, as compared to those censuses that were done in the 1980s, and probably the best one is to look at the dark dots, which are kind of the overall population <laughs> estimate. The others are kind of daily encounter rates, but um, essentially we have seen a fairly um, prominent decline since the 1980s in the deer population. And simulations of chronic wasting disease, um, certainly this disease is still not all that well understood. And because it is a fairly recently evolved disease, the understanding of kind of the long-term impacts of it on wild populations is still being figured out. But simulations show that you should see an increase in prevalence over time and a decrease in populations, and then probably at some point some type of a leveling off in those two, um, some sort of kind of equilibrium point. So in 2018, we have a good opportunity. Um, there's renewed interest at the state level in chronic wasting disease. Um, the state is going to be going to mandatory submissions of um, hunter-killed deer again in some areas in the state. Um, and so that allows us to really leverage substantial um, Colorado Parks and Wildlife resources. They have a lot of funding and a lot of interest in better understanding chronic wasting disease. They also have a lot of staff that have extensive experience as well as veterinary staff that have a lot of experience in animal capture. And it's also 10 years after our last study and 30 years after that initial population estimate. So it's an opportunity to get another data point on chronic wasting disease and that population. And that allows us to begin to track those long-term trajectories of the disease and what it may or may not be doing to populations. And so in order to get at not only the population estimate but the chronic wasting disease prevalence, you have to capture the mule deer. And that, that's a fairly substantial undertaking. So that also provides us the opportunity then to collect a lot of other interesting data on mule deer because it gives us the opportunity to put collars on the mule deer. And since that previous study where we did have radio collars on mule deer, um, technology has advanced substantially and GPS collars now come at a relatively low cost, but probably a tenth of the cost that they would have been 10 years ago and probably half the size. So there's been a lot of technology adaptation that's happened. So um, it gives us a, an opportunity to really collect a lot more data on the mule deer than we've ever had the opportunity to do before which then allows us an opportunity to better understand these foothills ecosystems, how the deer are moving across the landscape, what habitats they're selecting, how they may or may not be interacting with the mountain lions, with people, all kinds of really interesting questions. And so the capture, testing, and counting piece will be essentially the collaborative piece with Colorado Parks and Wildlife. And we will resample the same area, uh, the same herd of deer as we did before, which has been called the Table Mesa um, deer herd in our previous study. So that will be a one-time sample collection and capture. Um, we will capture them, mark them with ear tags and radio collars, and test them for CWD. And then we will complete a population census. 
And then following that, after we've put the collars on, the, we can then do monitoring with GPS collars. And I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail, but essentially this allows us to use, to use the data on where the deer are to look at their habitat selection. We can then compare that to um, the presence of habitats on the landscape to see if they're favoring certain habitats. And we can then overlay that data with a number of different variables. We'll have their CWD status to see if that um, impacts their habitat use, their location. We will be um, capturing both urban as well as open space deer. Uh, the demographics, age, whether they're male or female, um, as related to a lot of habitat variables. So we have things like the tall oak grass infestation in this area, and so seeing how that might impact their habitat use. Um, we can look at human use, different grazing, different forestry treatments, and how they seem to be responding to those. We can also look at mortality factors. Uh, the collars let us know um, when the deer hasn't moved in a certain period of time, which then allows us to go out and see, does this appear to be a deer that was hit by a car or a deer that clearly is being eaten by a mountain lion? And then we can also look at movement. Um, we will get frequent enough information to have some ideas of where these deer are moving, what their movement corridors are, and how they're using the landscape. And then also to look at those interactions with mountain lions as far as that predation goes, um, as well as other mortality factors that may be impacting them. So the study area is, is basically kind of the, not the far southern part of our system, but the southern portion of Boulder. Um, it's kind of the Table Mesa area with uh, baseline on the east, uh, sorry, baseline on the north, Broadway on the east, El Dorado Springs Drive on the south, and then essentially the Flatirons backdrop. Occasionally they do wander up to the backside of Flagstaff, so we will track them up there. And the, the sample size that we're really looking for is a, a minimum of 30 males and 40 females. We may capture up to 100 if we have good luck, and we have 50 collars that we can deploy. So the field methods, as I said, we're gonna capture up to 100 deer, but we're hoping to have at least 70, and that's really based on the power needed to detect the changes in the chronic wasting disease presence. Mm -hmm. And so we'll be darting them with an anesthetic drug. Um, the darting will be done by, um, C sorry, that's supposed to be CPW personnel, not CWD personnel, CPW <laughs> personnel. <laughs> and uh, four of our rangers who are gonna be getting trained in the darting. Um, we'll be collecting samples. Um, the chronic wasting disease can be detected through rectal biopsy samples, so that is a live test for chronic wasting disease. We'll also be drawing blood to look at the genotype because there seems to be some interaction between chronic wasting disease and genotype. We'll be looking at the age and the sex of the animal, looking at body condition. Uh, we'll mark them with small, they're about, I should have brought one of those, about a little bit bigger than a quarter, maybe a half dollar size um, blue button ear tag. And then for selected animals, we'll fit them with a radio collar. And we'll be deploying those radio collars to try and get a variety of um, sexes of deer, both male and females, try to deploy the collars in different locations, different social groups, so that we're getting a pretty broad sampling of the deer on open space. And then will administer a reversal drug that wakes them up fairly quickly. So these are pictures actually from 2005 through, through, through 2007 capture and marking. Um, I don't think any of these staff are still here, but um, they all were involved at the time. And so you can see some deer were far out in open space, um, some deer were sitting in people's backyards. And then the population census will be completed in early December, and that is eight routes. Those were established in the 1980s, so we can actually walk and drive the same routes um, for comparison. And that'll be done with OSMP staff as well as CPW staff and potentially volunteers. And then we're counting marked and unmarked animals observed and using something called Bowden's Estimator to come up with a, a population estimate. And then for the monitoring, we do have 50 GPS collars, and I brought a prop. And I will show you, but I'll bring it up to you. But this is one of the GPS collars. This is astounding to me because um, it is smaller and lighter than the non-GPS collars were 10 years ago. The VHF non-GPS collars had a big antenna that stuck up like this that the deer tended to get caught on things and other problems. Um, this is um, equipped with a couple of pretty interesting features. This is the transmitter and the antenna. Um, the battery will go down here. It's missing because once you plug in the battery, that that's the time limited part of the collar is the, is the battery. But this one is a buck collar, so it actually has this magnetic 
expansion built into it because during the rut in the fall, um, the buck's necks can almost double in size. So a color has to have the ability to expand and then go back down when, um, when it's past the rut. And then it also has this mechanism here which can be set for a specific time or activated remotely to um, separate at this point so that the collar falls off of the deer. So the hope is that with most of these collars, we won't have to go back out and capture the deer. After two years, they will just drop the collar, we'll go out and pick up the collar and they can go about their business. So I'll let you take a look at this. And how, how heavy is the battery? Is it's not all that So we do have 50 of those. Like I said, some of them are fit with the um, expansion and some are not. Um, so the batteries will last for approximately two years based on our current settings of getting basically three locations in a 24 hour period. You can set that to be as often as every hour, but then the battery lasts less um, time. So we're looking at two years with um, a location every eight hours. And then we'll also be getting visual assessments of the deer. It's also a VHF collar, so we can go out with the good old Yagi antenna and walk around and find the deer. Um, make sure that the collar isn't causing problems and look at their body condition and that type of thing. Um, at first, we'll find them pretty frequently to make sure that there aren't any issues with the collars. After that, we'll probably go to every couple weeks. And then, like I said, there is a remote drop-off mechanism. These are pictures last time when, um, in order to find the deer, our technicians had to go out and find every single deer every single week. It was pretty intensive, and if you remember um, the winter of what would it have been, 2006? <laughs> you could see um, there was a lot of snow. So we'll see if it's a winter like that. Mm -hmm. And the staff that will be involved, there are a variety of open space staff. Um, all of our wildlife staff will be involved. Um, for the darting and portions of the field work, we do have four of our rangers that are going to be involved. CPW has um, a couple of their wildlife health veterinarians who will be involved in support as well as a couple of field staff. Mary Wright is our vet that we work with for our DEA licensing and prescriptions for the anesthetic drugs. And then the funding will be coming from open space as well as Colorado Parks and Wildlife. So some of the benefits is it provides us information to just better understand what is going on in these foothills ecosystems with some of our large um, charismatic megafauna. Um, it also provides information on CWD dynamics in a non-hunted herd. This is one of the real reasons that CPW is so intensely interested is they don't have a lot of reference herds that aren't managed through hunting. And so they don't know what the disease does without hunting being one of the factors. So it's kind of a unique situation for them. And it also allows us to understand the habitat selection, how they're moving, and how that is related to a variety of different habitat variables that we're interested in. It can help inform our planning, management, and public interpretation and outreach about deer as well as mountain lions. And it gives us an opportunity to collect data that really wouldn't be feasible for us as a department without the collaboration with Parks and Wildlife. So our schedule and next steps, we're currently in the process of furiously getting permits, agreements in place, getting property access, purchasing supplies, and working on our outreach plans. October 3rd, um, the full team will be up in, in Fort Collins for an all-day training with CPW. And October 18th, we'll begin capture. We'll be out two times a week. Uh, early December, we'll have two weeks of the Mark Recite Census. And then we'll have additional capture in December through March after that Mark Recite Census is complete. And then we'll have the ongoing monitoring of the collared deer. A lot of that will be remotely where it's, we just have to go to a website to download those location points, but there will be that periodic location to make sure that there aren't any issues with the collar and to assess body condition. And then the collars will drop off after two years. Um, if there are any that do not, we will have to go out and do a second darting event to get the collars off of them because our intent is not to leave any animals on the landscape wearing collars. And then data, data, analysis and, as data analysis and reporting will start in 2019 for the CWD and population estimate pieces because that part will be complete. And then in 2021 for our movement and habitat use data after we've collected the full suite of the, the collar data. So are there any questions? Yes. Um, I thought I'd just amuse everyone else that I told Heather that um, three mule deer like to camp out right outside my office window at NOAA yes. regularly, <laughs> so I'm looking forward to seeing blue tags on their ears. Um, 
Uh, I'm a GPS researcher. I do that for a living, so I'm a little curious about the collars. Um, GPS is a passive system. Signals mm -hmm. come down. You use it for positioning. So um, what is going to be your sample rate with the... Um, with the actual positioning of the animals, you know, how many times per day are you going to... So, so it will collect information three times a day. Okay. And then that is transmitted through cell phone networks. Okay. And so to the degree that the caller is in an area of cell phone coverage, uh -huh. that data will be downloaded um, three times a day. If okay. they don't have cell phone coverage, then the caller stores that information and it's uploaded the next time that they have cell phone coverage. Yeah. And since the expectation is that these animals are staying on this side of the mountains. Generally, yeah. And, and if, if they disappear for a long time, we also can go um, and remotely download the data by getting in close proximity to the collar. Okay. We hope in this landscape that that won't really be necessary. Mm -hmm. um, and since we're not doing ongoing analysis, we're going to try and collect the data and then undergo analysis. We can also wait a while until that deer, they almost always end up back on the front side right. and, uh, you know, would be within cell coverage. Okay. Uh, three times a day uh, um, uplink, if you will. So, but mm -hmm. like, uh, how how many times per day are you gonna know where the? I'm sorry. Are you going to know every single second where the animal is? We're not. So it sort of turns on and off three times a day. And oh. that and that's part of the battery life I piece of it. Okay. And you can program it to be as frequently as every hour. But with that, um, you know, three times a day, it lasts for two years. If you do it six times a day, it's only going to last for a year. So you pretty quickly start to have fairly short battery life mm -hmm. periods. Mm -hmm. um, so we decided two years was, was good. And really, every eight hours over a two-year period will probably give us a pretty good idea of where those individual deer are spending their time. Got it. Thank you. Seems to me with deer starting to show up with these collars on and the blue buttons in their ears, the public's going to want to know a lot about this. Mm -hmm. Is yeah. Bill Yates working on this as well as <laughs> things that he's working so, on? So we are definitely going to have a website about it, and we'll do some outreach as we start to put collars and ear tags out on the landscape. That's one thing that I'm just working on now. Um, some of the public will have been accustomed to this when it happened 10 years ago, if they were in the area at that time. Um, at that time, I would say we did really extensive public outreach and expected it to be a huge deal. Mm -hmm. and. Nobody paid any attention, <laughs> except for the people whose, whose deer that spent every day in their yard came to their yard with a radio collar, and they were thrilled because now they could tell which deer was which. So <laughs> I was, I was fairly surprised by the public reaction, actually, but we will absolutely be making sure that the word gets out My about who's doing it, what it the purpose the is. Page of the paper, people are going to notice. Absolutely. And yeah, given and the Elk Mountain... Rabbit Mountain yeah. control activities. Mm -hmm. I think people may be more sensitive to that may be. walking yeah. around with what looks like a rifle. Yeah. So, yeah, I agree. A front page would be a good idea. Yeah, and that's generally why the darting is done. Um, not only because they're they're also trained with firearms and marksmanship, but also with our rangers and CPW. So it is somebody in a uniform that's doing the darting instead yeah, of good. kind of a unidentifiable person stalking through the woods. If you put collars on 70, uh, or say 50 deer, mm -hmm. what percentage of the, uh, approximately what percentage of the total local deer population is that? Well, we don't know. Um, we have to see what the population is now. Back um, 10 years ago, I think we, that would have been about a fifth of the population. Um, that may or may not hold true now. Um, we haven't had any indication that there's been a huge drop in the population. We haven't been receiving reports that people don't see deer anymore. We haven't seen um, issues associated with there not being deer browsing on the landscape. But um, certainly the modeling based on that chronic wasting disease prevalence would suggest that the population should have declined. So um, we're really interested to see what's actually happened. Yeah, I was just curious to get a sense of what portion of the deer in that area we um, walking around with collars on. Do we know if having a collar on differentially affects your probability of getting eaten by a mountain lion? We don't know for sure, although there certainly have been, especially on white-tailed deer, been some studies looking at at least survivorship of collared and uncollared deer, and it doesn't really seem to have an impact. Certainly for a predator that, that kills its prey by going for the neck, it, it would seem logical that it might have some impact, right. but I would say they seem to have no problem catching our collared deer last time. We had a, a pretty high level of um, lion depredation. 
So at least anecdotally, they, okay. they seem to be able to work around it. So just historic curiosity. Would you ask me to put this on? <laughs> I tried to convince my kids and they weren't interested. <laughs> Those of us that were living in the Table Mesa area in the early 1980s were very familiar with the peak population mm -hmm. since they were all sleeping in our yards at that time. What's your interpretation? One, do we think that was a peak? Uh, that's my first question. <laughs> Two, if so, why was the population so high then? Were there fewer mountain lions? Was there no chronic wasting disease in that time? What, what, what's your sense? Well, so I, mostly it's I don't know. It seems to have been a high population time based on level of conflict. There weren't earlier population surveys, and CPW at the time, CDOW, didn't do quite as extensive population surveys as they do now, so there aren't a lot of baselines to compare it to. Now, whether that is, with conflict, it's always hard to know if there are actually more animals, or there are just more animals spending time close to people, or there are more people closer to the animals, yeah. so it's hard to know, but certainly that seemed to be a fairly high population time. As far as causes, I really don't know. Mm. Um, sometimes was that pre-wasting? Pre that was pre-wasting disease. So the first evidence of chronic wasting disease in the wild was in 1996. I see. So I'm sorry, 1996 in Boulder. So um, that was when there was the first vehicle collision with a deer that then came back positive hmm. for CWD, and that wasn't all that long after it had been discovered in the wild for the first time. So it really is something that they think actually developed through mutation in captive animals and then moved into wild animals. So it's a it's a fairly new challenge to wild populations. Populations. <clears throat> and it's not a threat of transmission to the mountain lion population? It doesn't seem to be. Um, the, the vets up at Fort Collins have had, it used to be three, one has passed away, but um, three captive mountain lions who they um, essentially fed chronic wasting disease infected meat for a decade or more wow. and had no evidence of any type of impact on the lions. So it's True. fairly conclusive that it doesn't seem to impact them. I have one last question for you, but it's about hawthorn bushes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's been an, an extraordinary hawthorn blight this year. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just remarkable the extent of it. And I assume it's not going to kill all the hawthorn bushes. Does it have other ecological ripple effects, though? It's, uh, I mean, I don't. Yeah, it, it is certainly something that, that's present every year at some level. In some years, it seems to be really very obvious. I would say that given that it seems to have been in the population for a long time, um, it doesn't seem to have an impact that you know, results in replacement of stands of Hawthorne with other things. Um, I'm, I don't know if it impacts sort of the fruit bearing ability of the shrub in a bad year or not, I mean, um, which certainly then could have impacts on, the, the you know, other species. The ones that I see have all started dropping leaves really early. I mean, it looks like they're... It looks pretty bad. Well, so. maybe we'll see next year. This yeah. may be worse than other years that we've seen, and, and it may be that there are impacts beyond what we've seen previously. You'd think it would be self-limiting or it wouldn't be around. Thank you. Yeah. May I ask you just a quick financial question? Sure. In terms of the investment in this collaborative effort between CPW and the department, is it like 50-50? <clears throat> or just give us a rough comparison of investment. Well, I, w I would say we, we don't have full um, kind of expenditures for everything because not everything has yet been acquired. Um, I would say generally for the capture, um, CPW is, is paying the lion's share of everything for that. Um, we buy kind of the basic equipment. They supply a lot of the medical equipment required and a lot of the training and expertise. So I would say they definitely fund most of that. Um, as far as the collars, because that's really our study, we have we have paid for all of the collars. And so that all came out of half of the collars were purchased in 2018 and half of them were purchased this year. So that came out of our wildlife program budget for the collars. And then um, the cost of staffing is probably the most significant. And so that is um, probably not quite split evenly for the for the capture, but certainly um, CPW will have several personnel down here on a regular basis. For the collar monitoring, that will be exclusively open space. So we'll be covering that staffing. And most of that work will be done by our um, temporary field technicians um, with our standard staff out as much as we can manage to get out to help with that. Thanks. 
Okay. Okay. Thanks, Heather. Thank you. Can I grab? And, and I think Heather gets the oh, best sorry. best prop award of the year. Uh, right. She does absolutely. Thank you so much for bringing that. And Dan, um, that is all we have on uh, the large herbivores. Uh, noted that the small herbivores are next on on the board's <laughs> agenda. And I would just ask if Heather would stick around in case the board has any questions uh, on prairie dogs. That's good. So Tom, right. I think we're up to matters from the board. All right. So I think that, that just brings it back to the issue of the um, uh, our recommendation on the prairie dogs. So I guess the question is how we want to proceed on this. I think we've all had a chance to study what staff prepared. Um, and I have a proposed revision at the appropriate time. I think, well, this would be... The appropriate uh, time? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Leah, as always. Uh, and thanks to staff for making some sense out of <laughs> hammering that we did. We did the best we could. We were all over the place. And uh, so anyway, thank you. Uh, this really was a helpful springboard. So when I looked at this, I wanted to add a couple thoughts to it. I wanted to add, before we get into the details, I wanted to add at the front end our thanks to the Prairie Dog Working Group and the staff that have worked on this for so long, because, I mean, it really was an enormous amount of work. So I wanted to add that at the beginning, and then I wanted to add at the end the thought that we would certainly be open to having more discussions with the group about individual uh, elements of their plan, even if we weren't able to support the whole plan as a package right now. So when I started putting that in, I decided, well, maybe I'll just try to compress all the other things you captured here into a shorter statement. And so that's what I tried to do. Uh, and I will acknowledge by way of sharing the blame that Karen has looked at this and added a couple edits, which I've incorporated. So. I'll read it very quickly. First, uh, OSBT wishes to thank the Prairie Dog Working Group for the long and difficult work they've undertaken to address this critical issue. We commend especially their recommendations on relocation of prairie dogs, which will enable essential relocations to proceed in ways more acceptable to the broad community and more likely to succeed for the prairie dog colonies. So that's really the phase one work, and I really do think they moved the ball a long ways down the road on that, and I wanted to acknowledge that. For the Prairie Dog Working Group Phase 2 efforts, we commend their willingness to look at the breadth and scope of the issues with a long-term vision. Uh, we believe there are many aspects within their Phase 2 package of recommendations that will be critical to the management of prairie dogs on OSMP lands. However, we cannot endorse the recommendations as a whole, as the group requested, for the following reasons. And remember, the group said a couple different times, we view this as a package which needs to be moved forward as a whole, so that's why I was responding to that. Number one, OSBT does not have the budget or staff resources to implement the recommendations, and we could add the words as a whole. Uh, I'm certainly open to any and all changes here. The recommended actions would impact directly many aspects of OSMP operations, our lessees and our neighbors, as well as many of our critical grasslands and agricultural lands. Three, such a broad program before endorsement requires substantial budgetary and staff planning, consultation with numerous constituents, and integration with or revision of several existing resource management plans. Four, we lack the ability to forecast the impacts of the program plan on our natural resources or even to know what land resources would be necessary to ensure success. It seems clear that such a plan could not be implemented successfully just on OSMP lands. And you could say a lot more about each one of these points. And to close, OSBT would like to continue discussions with the Prairie Dog Working Group and associated staff to determine what initial steps could be undertaken within the constraints of our finances, staff, and natural resources as we proceed with the master plan development and implementation. Amendments welcome. Well, uh, thank you. I think that's in incredibly helpful. Um, one of the things that we had discussed a few times last month was that 
some portion of this maybe has master plan implications. Mm -hmm. And there was a little bit of a, are we, you know, tackling this perhaps in advance of the master plan? And I wonder in that spirit whether under three where I think this is sort of where you're picking up this concept at the end. It says several existing resource management plans um, you've already got integration with. So, in, you know, um, if perhaps at the end of that, some notion ought to be included um, um, as well as the master planning process. Uh, yeah, or, as well as inclusion or something like that, as well as inclusion in the ongoing master I like uh, that. plan process. In, yeah. She's so quick. <laughs> and then inclusion with a. I, I like that, Tom. And I welcome anything from staff if you feel like we've left out a critical aspect that, uh, you know, I just didn't manage to cover in a general way. Uh, I'm happy to try to add. In. Yes, Heather. I guess just one point of clarification. So um, on number, oh, after number four, kind of that conclusion statement, yeah. would like to continue discussions with the Prairie Dog Working Group. At this point, the Prairie Dog Working Group has been. They go away. Right. Um, and I, Jane could certainly decide to modify that in the future, but at, at, at least as of today, that's kind of the status of the Prairie Dog Working Group is they, they've been asked to certainly stay engaged as, you know, individual, very yeah. concerned citizens with a lot of information and understanding of the, of the issues. I had that suspicion too. So we could say discussions with the Can we say staff. discussions about the Prairie Dog Working Group recommendations? Um, sh sure. I mean, I, 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 I know folks like Heather were involved from and the very beginning to the very end on sure. this. And so, sure. um, but how, you got some more did you want to propose, Karen? Recommendations. You could say and about the recommendations with staff? Yeah. Okay. Just with staff. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks, Heather. Can you go, um, go back to the... Uh, the lead-in says we cannot endorse the recommendations as a whole. Um, that's a pretty stark statement, and I'm just wondering, you know, is that one way to think about that is to imply we're just sort of thumbs down on the whole thing. Another way to think about that is do we mean, well, we're okay with 80% of it, mm -hmm. and but we're not going to, it, it, for, at this level, get into the detail of what we agree with and what we disagree with. And I'm just wondering whether there's some ambi <coughs> unintended ambiguity. Um, About at this time. Yeah, I think that's a good, as a whole, at this time. And maybe inappropriately, but I, the group did make quite clear that they thought this was a package. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. I'm trying to say we can't put our arms around the whole thing well, yeah. and then leave it open to discuss individual elements. But if you got some words to soften that little, Tom, I'd certainly say sure. Well, your prior sentence, we believe there, uh, implies that yeah. we think there's some good, good in it. And I also, yeah. and I may have mis mischaracterized in the dynamics of that discussion, I thought the comment about it was a package was really an agreement within the Prairie Dog Working Group that while some of the members of the group may have liked some parts of it and not liked others, that having reached the compromises that they reached, they, and then we're now taking this out to various other uh, bodies, such as ourselves, didn't want to say, well, actually, I liked X, mm -hmm. but I didn't like Y, that they agreed you make a compromise, you defend the package as a package. Mm -hmm. Not that that disempowers us, 
from doing some picking and choosing if uh, they did actually have a minority report in there saying this one person doesn't agree with these particular mm -hmm. elements. I thought it was directed more at funding. Uh, I thought they said more than once, you need to fund the whole thing. Um, that's how I read it. But it but doesn't I'm, work as, well, maybe it's worth. Uh, yeah, let's yeah, maybe, ask the maybe, expert maybe, here. Maybe, <laughs> Heather, yeah. it was sort of, was the idea that it only made sense as a package and see there's either thumbs up or thumbs down as a package or were there you could do some picking and choosing depending I, on I your I think the, the discussion with the pre-dog working group was that there were a lot of interrelated pieces mm -hmm. where one thing would work well as long as you did the other thing. And so I think the feeling within the group was they really did not want to see it picked apart. They wanted it all to be okay. um, accepted. Now, certainly my guess would be, not speaking for the whole group, that if, if it's, you know, they also didn't mean all or nothing. You know, if it's not going to be all, they probably would prefer some of it over none of it. Um, but we did talk about prioritizing the actions and trying to kind of pick out the, what are your top ones that you really want to see happen. And, and the group really resisted that activity and wanted to be sure that it was all brought forward as a whole package. So I did want to provide a quick update. We did have a meeting with the city manager this week um, to strategize before we take this to city council in October. And her direction to staff is to discuss with city council, coming back to them in the spring with a more in-depth analysis like they and you are accustomed to seeing from staff mm -hmm. on each individual item, possible implementation plans, the implications of those different phases and what those would look like. So a lot more detailed information, not necessarily on the full package all at once but maybe realistic plans for implementation. So um, if council likes that approach, I, th I think that's um, what the city manager is looking at for staff to do. Do you see this as a useful statement to council? I, I think that if, if it's the feedback that the board would like to give on the recommendations, I think council will find it very useful. I, I think they probably have not had the opportunity to follow the process as closely as you have. They have not had the benefit of um, updates periodically by Carrie as the process has gone along. Um, so I, you know, I think the feedback from the boards is very helpful to them um, to hear from the different boards you know, that have different purviews as far as how it would be impacted by the recommendations um, to get that feedback as they kind of try to digest this fairly large chunk that will have been set on their plate. Well, and my comment about council is I cannot begin to imagine council members spending as much time as I had to spend trying to work my way through that yeah, it's a document. Fun. It is right. It is really complex and complicated and so I think we do need to make some clear recommendation to them, assuming that they're not going to put as much time into dissecting the whole thing and trying to understand it as we did. And I think part of what we're conveying here is how complicated this all is and how much careful planning it would take. And so I'm happy to hear this idea of coming back with more thought, more analysis that would give us more time to understand your views on it. and maybe start to coalesce around some things we think would be first steps because honestly right now if you had to i couldn't tell you where to start it's it's a lot to well and as heather just said it's not only a lot but they're interlinking pieces mm -hmm. so you can't just take one part and say well let's do that that sounds good yeah because it may impact another element Thank you for putting this together. Um, the one thing I'm struggling with is that um, we have a lot of ways that we said, no, not right now. But I'm not seeing another a, a statement of, but prairie dogs are an important part of our system, and we do need to address it rather than be like, and thanks, working group, and we're putting your report on a shelf, and we'll, yeah. you know, 20, 30 years from now, maybe dust it off again. Um, so, you know, inclusion in the ongoing master plan process is a great way to go, you know, a great link into, yes, we will continue to address this, but I'm sorry, I, fair I, point. I, I, have a, yeah. I have a concern without a way to address The only it. thing well, we well, say in the last that, paragraph, oh. I think what you said, they're, they're an important part of OSMP system. 
We could put some more words, though, in the last part that really talk about that. The, the only thing it says is in the first sentence, it says this critical issue, but it, mm -hmm. it doesn't say anything more than that. You wouldn't know that prairie dogs were a keystone species or anything. Yeah, from yeah. This. So um, if you would add some words or suggest some words anywhere, I think that would be fine. How about a, a, like maybe at the, a, at the beginning of the conclusion paragraph? Yeah. Um, because prairie dogs are. Yeah, mm -hmm. because prairie dogs are a keystone species. And an integral part of the open space system, comma. Good. Yeah. Sure. Good. OK. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. We're not voting on this, but are, does anyone have further edits or? No, I like no, it. This okay. is good. Ship it. Ship it. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you. Okay. Thank you, <laughs> thank you. Thanks for pulling this together, everyone. So the next item is to dis uh, is this issue of we have some it, both. Um, some upcoming events, as well as the more general question of having more than two board members at a particular event, and how do we uh, sort of more formally announce that a particular upcoming event is a publicly noticed open space board you know meeting that there may be more than two board members there, so that you know we've covered the bases and to, you know, I think the suggestion is a good one that we ought to be more formal about doing that and, um, you know, I think in the ongoing future to look to staff but also ourselves to make sure we're sort of flagging that issue about, you know, hey, we've got something coming up and let's be clear about whether or not this is going to be noticed um, as an open space board meeting. Um, so, for example, we have the EAB, which we said in our minutes, both Karen and I were going to attend. Do we need to do more of a notice about that? Our understanding is that uh, that is being taken care of um, by another city department of publicly, publicly noticing that particular meeting. Right. And it's exactly that kind of okay. issue. I think, as Dan's saying, that particular one is taken care of, but it's also being aware of and being sensitive to you know, that discussion, I think, was more in the nature of making sure we have representation. I don't think we meant to say, and it's capped at two people, and therefore the other three are, and if we, if we meant to say it's capped at two, that's, mm -hmm. that's fine, but I don't think we actually crossed yeah. that bridge and explicitly said, you know, it's two and no more than two, mm -hmm. and if, if what we mean is, well, we've got at least two, but others may decide they wish to attend, then we, you know, that one's taken care of, but in the future, that means we need to be, you know, sensitive to exactly what are we saying and do we want to notice that as an open space, you know, board meeting so that we have the option. If a third person wants to show up, they show up. Yeah. Yep. Um, I think it would be informative for me to know if there's a recent example where we, we messed this up so that, no? Okay. Well, there's, there was an example during the North TSA where three of us showed up, and I on, left. On like a tour or something, or? Well, it was akin to the community workshop. Mm -hmm. um, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it was not some, you know, enormous <laughs> problem, but three people did show up, and you know, one of us was going to have to leave, and um, oh, okay. it would have been an example of where, you know, thinking about it ahead of time, we probably should have said, you know, why don't we just change how this is being noticed. Mm -hmm. okay. and, and actually, in a, in a procedural document was created uh, to sort of guide us on how we would go about uh, doing this. And so we just want to make sure that we took the time to create a procedural document. Let's just make sure we follow okay. it in all occasion. And since we have a, uh, some meetings coming up throughout the fall, uh, we thought we would just bring attention to that. Right. Oh, and, okay. and the so the immediate next one on our 
radar is the October 1st community workshop. Right. And you have nothing um, later this month. Um, that would meet the spirit of the procedural document. Right. Okay. So. I guess I remembered incorrectly. I thought you said that all of those workshops you were intending to publicly notice them. I guess I misinterpreted that as as a meeting of the Open Space Board of Trustees. Okay. Um, I had that impression too. Okay. Um, I thought I thought that staff was already working from the assumption that more than two uh, members of the Open Space Board would probably end up attending those meetings. I think they, the, that was the vision that more than two would attend, and I think staff's suggestion is that we more formally tell the public that um, that, that is the case. Not just that we internally know that that is our intention, right. that we right. sort of announce to the public, um, I mean, the, that that would be the concept. Okay. The, I, right. I, there's a, there's a touchy balance, though, isn't there, between saying this is a board meeting and saying this is a community workshop? I don't want to leave people with the impression that this is a board meeting. Um, under, under the process document that was created, there was a definition of a public participation event, and it describes a public participation event as a type of special meeting. Um, and public participation events include, but are, are not limited to open houses, round tables, charrettes, administrative hearings, workshops, and other forms for public participation used to facilitate or advance the planning and operations of the department. So that's sort of the definition that got created on when we probably should notice that it's, we're calling this a special meeting of the board and that so those are all board members are then are free to show up and we don't have to worry about the, the So when we talked about uh, your announcement of all the workshops, Philip, is, are those the words we're gonna use? It's somewhere it would say, this is also a special meeting of the board or is that what the requirement is as you see it? Well, so for announcements of workshops like this, you know, we certainly could put it in there and say that uh, we expect members of the council and the board will attend and that could serve as public notice, but usually what we would like to do is probably get it, Leah, tell me if I'm wrong, and you could probably walk us through some of the steps because you, you know this. Yeah, do you want me to just Yeah. Um, so all of the workshops will be noticed the same way that we notice a board meeting, but basically using that language that board members will be present. Having Tom talk about it during the meeting just puts us to be in a little bit more consistent level of things. So it's not a, nothing's changing, we're just mm -hmm. adding a placeholder in the agenda. So it's still being noticed the same. Mm -hmm. Tom's just stating it, so we're super clear. Mm -hmm. So the label in the newspaper advertisement on Sunday will say community workshop or will we'll yeah, say right. OSBT meeting? No. It'll say community workshop or master plan, open house or master plan, whatever the title is, and then in the context, it'll just say open space board members may be present. Mm -hmm. I think that's great. I like yeah, okay. great. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> so and this, and this really is just to set us in on, now we have yeah. a process, and so when we have even a little bit of a, a less direct example of, of that, we, we have a process we can quickly go through and uh, if we have something we're doing out on the land or something that's gonna be, and we don't wanna worry about whether it's two or three of you, we have a process that we've been working through to, to deal with that issue too. And the idea is we, at every board meeting, we run through the next month yep, or We two look ahead, so yep, and that's something that okay. Steve and I will sort of be wearing that hat and then we'll meet with Tom and he'll be wearing that and we'll just kind of look ahead four, four to five weeks out and just see what's up. Okay, Great. cool. Okay, so we are agreed mm -hmm. that the October 1 community workshop on ecological health and res uh, resilience will be called as a special meeting of the Open Space Board of Trustees. Yes. Yes, <laughs> make sure we're all. Yep. Okay, and we're. We're all in agreement on that. All right, so the next, uh, we had a couple more matters from the board. Uh, Kurt, did you want to talk about sure. CU South and flood mitigation? Sure, and uh, Dan brought this up before, and I appreciate that summary that he gave us, that uh, council uh, a while back deliberated on uh, flood mitigation options for South Boulder Creek and talked about variants one and two, and in the end they adopted variant one 
with further direction to look at additional upstream storage. Now, uh, having watched that meeting, at least on television, uh, it was notable that when Councilman Brockett uh, brought up his proposal, variant two, that was his preferred plan, he said, I also endorse the Open Space Board of Trustees uh, mitigation measures that they're proposing here. I think they're very good, blah, blah, blah. Uh, when variant two did not receive a majority of the votes, they went on and uh, selected variant one, but there was no discussion of the mitigation measures at that time. And my impression was that wasn't a particularly uh, intentional act to uh, say we don't want to do these mitigation measures that uh, the board in our several motions uh, on July 11th uh, put forward as recommended mitigations that would go with variant one. And at the same time, we also recommended mitigation measures for variant two. I didn't get the impression council was uh, indicating they were not interested in those. Um, I did send an email to one council member just sort of asking that question. Uh, do you think this would be appropriate to bring back to council to confirm one way or the other whether council uh, supported our mitigation measures as part of the package or not? This council member said, yes, I think that would be worth doing. You can work with our agenda committee, et cetera, et cetera. So, what I would be proposing, and I would look to staff to figure out the best process for this to happen, is that we are simply taking the measures that we've adopted already, uh, the previous motions, and asking council if they think it's worth their time, because they are always very, very full agendas for council, to take it up uh, formally and make some uh, vote or motion on it. Uh, because I know one thing they're trying to do right now, and it alludes to uh, Dan's summary, is they're, they're trying to finalize some of the details about the mitigation, or I'm sorry, the uh, yeah, flood mitigation package. So I think the timing is actually good for us to say, well, do you want to act on these mitigation measures at the same time? So that would be what I would propose, but I am absolutely open to suggestions on how that happens. Well, maybe it's worth breaking the discussion, because I think there are two different questions yeah. here. There may be three, but there's at least two. One is, do we want to say something? And then the second, and the, the answer to that is yes. Then there's a question of how do we get that communicated? There may also be a question of what exactly is the message, but uh, um, so maybe it's useful to break those and see whether first people agree with Kurt that we do want to say something to council to, you know, see if they wish to clarify whether they intended or not to include our sort of uh, our attachment A as part of, um, you know, their, their going forward. So, you know, I think normally I would be very reluctant to sort of, after a council vote, to say, hey, you sort of did forgot about that? our, yeah, did you really mean that? Because you didn't do what we told you to do. Um, that would seem, you know, not our place. Um, but on this one, I think it is the nature of the way this came up, that it would not be implying that they disagreed with us and we want them to reconsider it. I think it is a case where probably it didn't get focused on and there is value in our reminding them that, you know, this was, an, from our perspective, at least this was an important piece and um, worth a, a focused answer. So I, I share Kurt's suggestion that we, you know, send it up the chain and, you know, They'll do what they do with it. I agree. We should respectfully resubmit it. <laughs> yes. And uh, my, my perception was that it was totally unintentional as yeah, well. So. Late night meeting, people are tired. <laughs> it was you know. very late. Yes. Yeah. Right. yeah, totally. Okay. So with that, then the question is, um, how do we uh, wish to communicate this? And I'm we defer to staff. I think, well, you know, we have our own, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. lines of communication, but I think it is preferable if staff want to go through, um, you know, your own channels to have something brought to the, uh, mm -hmm. the CAC. It's perhaps something where uh, John Potter, who's been the lead for us on this project, that John and I could kind of mull this over a little bit and then maybe work with uh, the chair. Um, yeah. Uh, in order to determine the appropriate uh, avenue. 
I've also seen some informal things for getting some initial, as Hotline's been very active, and there's uh, council members have been very responsive. And I could see if a question uh, through that is posed by the board to council on a hotline might give some immediate type of thing. It maybe wouldn't be the permanent type of formal thing. That, but I, I would say that could be a step that could be taken independently. Be, and then another step is John and I talk it over and maybe get together with Tom to, to talk about what the appropriate step would be. Yeah, and in terms of timing, I think this all needs to be done before the September 20th meeting. Is that what you're implying? I think they're engaged in these issues right now. Yeah. Because it, my perception is that, that at the September 20th meeting, they're going to take the next step to sort of bless yeah. a future direction by uh, the utility staff and consultant mm -hmm. engineers. That's why I introduced this notion of a hotline response, because that could go out immediately. We're trying to get, could, should we put it on the agenda? How do we get it on the agenda? We're talking, that could be, you know, weeks out versus days out. Well, and the and packet be might be sent to council as soon as tomorrow. That's, or is, yeah, yep, that's correct. But you're right, it may be hard to get it on their agenda very soon, so I think you guys should think about the best way forward. I mean, we're, we're giving you our request that it get back to council, and then we're gonna let you figure out how to do it, I guess. Uh, do is there enough discomfort by this board on just posting the hotline? I mean, I think it's a great idea. <laughs> you know, I think it's it may be sufficient. I don't know. Um, Could Tom po post a memo to the hotline stating that at our meeting last night? I mean, I'm assuming you're going to do this tomorrow, <laughs> as opposed to in the wee hours. Um, and then proceed to report it to council as a as a decision of the board from tonight. It, that may be fine. The only vague impression I got in my exchange with this council member was that if you want this to become city policy in further negotiations with the university, right. et cetera, et cetera, they would have to take it up probably. Right. So, and it's going to be on their agenda because their September 20th agenda item is to address the CU South flood mitigation plans right. based on a report by the utilities staff and <clears throat> consultants. So what would the request be that Tom makes, do you think, if he went that way? Would it be to put it on their agenda or? To consider this during their deliberation uh, September 20th of the CU South floodplain mitigation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. If that's, if you guys are comfortable with that, they'll listen to him. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <clears throat> and um, I had one more thing, and others may have items they wish to bring up. Um, and during the, um, I guess it was the July meeting where we voted on the package, one item in that package was a request that's on the disposal issue that we work with staff to identify the point in the process where it makes sense for us to take this up. Um, and I just thought we might want to spend a minute um, with staff to think about, well, uh, all right, what is our vision on that? Um, obviously, we don't want to do it too soon where the proposal hasn't really taken shape yet. We also don't want to do it too late where there might be a feeling of, wow, you waited till this process was really far along and then introduced this disposal notion, which, depending on which way the vote goes, might be perceived as potentially derailing or at least complicating that process. Um, and there's also additional notice issues associated with, you know, um, calling for a discussion of a disposal. Um, I don't know if you or John feel like you have a suggestion on sort of where um, in the process that would make the most sense, but 
you know, Kurt, my could son. You, could you read the part that well, says something about they come back to us at, when it's 30%, yeah. 60%, 90%? Yeah, and I was looking for that, and I was not finding it as quickly as I'd like. Yeah, that was diff that's a different, there's sort of two different motions here. Yeah, I think Tom's disposal motion also mentions some sort of a time to come back to look at that yeah, issue. But, but I think those check-ins are the point at which we need to say, hey, this design is going in the direction of disposal, and so we are requesting that the consultant blah, 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 blah. And this was the staff's drafted motion, and it should be in here, I just... Right, so my uh, motion was, yeah. um, in the event that one or more concepts proceed to preliminary design, OSBT intends to work with city staff to identify the point in the process at which such concepts have been sufficiently designed and specified such that OSBT can then make a fully informed decision on any disposal questions. Yeah. Good. And then there should so, be the other one in there about that, mm -hmm. that spelled out a number of checkpoints with open space staff. Right. And, and I think the spirit of checking in is is being honored, um, even Good. though it wasn't fully adopted as a council recommendation, because we are also viewed as a landowner. Mm -hmm. And in the latest draft memo that I've seen uh, come out from the utilities staff, is that we are perceived and being treated as a landowner, and that they repeatedly in several occasions throughout the memo said, and continue to work with, negotiate with, the landowners, and we are a landowner in this case in that definition. Okay. And so um, I know from a utility staff perspective that they have full intention of continuing to work very closely with our staff. Um, um, as far as maybe you're trying to get well, do we know enough yet a month later about where that exact time may be to bring that issue up? Um, I don't think we've learned enough, but John, I don't know if you have any comment on that at this point. Uh, no, well, not much, Dan, but other than probably that 30 or 60 percent design stage would be a good point to start to, re we start to really know whether they would need any structures on our properties, and you would also have an opportunity at that point to think about the extent of flooding that would be proposed. So. Yes, I don't think we should vote on the disposal repeatedly, as if at each step we're conducting a separate vote. And maybe for now, based on what's being discussed here, it makes sense to just uh, keep it in the back of our minds that um, if we decide, well, a 60 percent, that's the one that, you know, just to pick one of them, that that's a sort of a sensible point at which to have that discussion, we're going to need probably at the prior at the board meeting that precedes that one to make a clear decision that, all right, the next meeting we anticipate having that discussion so that the notice of our meeting can include, um, however we want to oh. phrase the disposal-related language, that's going to need a little bit further advance notice on on that. Mm -hmm. so and that would be a public hearing, right? Mm -hmm. And there may be, depending on uh, what type of disposal we think may be in play here, we may, it, we may want to have our, a city attorney representative here as well. Right, because there is, as we noted before, there's a question as to whether or not it's a disposal in the first place, which is different from the question of, well, if it is a disposal, do, you, do we wish to grant it or not? But there's that sort of more preliminary question of, well, given what's being proposed, whatever that turns out to be, does that constitute a disposal, you know, from our point of view? Right. So staff, as, as I think everyone knows, staff preliminary identified two potentials. Should we look at this further? And one is structures and one is additional inundation. And had and wanted to be proactive in looking at that ahead of time and had our city staff. And of course, you all in the memo got city staff's interpretation as they saw it. Um, we, there could still be options where additional inundation isn't even in play anymore. Uh, so, yeah, I think right now it's obviously too soon to kind of look at whether inundation itself or structures or the combination thereof, you know, do we, are we looking at a disposal? So, um. I really appreciate your paying attention to mm -hmm. the legal ramifications and all the pieces that need to be attended to. 
I, my concerns come before the 60 percent period, however, because we had a robust discussion about the apples and oranges and being able to see whether to, to see how different preliminary designs or concept designs or whatever adjective you want to put before the design um, impact OSMP lands and whether one approach was, in our views, less destructive than another. And to be able to do that, we need to keep track of the design process as it goes, I think, in a in a more up-to-date kind of way than marking a specific <coughs> point for a legal disposal discussion. So, and I'm assuming that if, if staff is represented at, at all the meetings that utilities has, and I, I keep hearing about meetings that you, the utilities department is having with CU, and so I know that those are going on, but I don't know how many meetings OSMP staff is at the table and involved in the, those discussions. So it would be helpful for me to understand a little bit more about the process from the staff mm -hmm. perspective. One suggestion that I could make at this time is, uh, in your written packet today, is another uh, Rocky Mountain Greenways update. I think that's almost the third or maybe fourth consecutive one you've received. Um, we could treat this project in a similar light. It may not be every board meeting, but uh, uh, we, are, we are very uh, engaged with utility staff. Um, John and Don are, are really part of a lot of uh, the discussion that w with that and getting updated. And perhaps we could make calls, if yeah. looking at every meeting, saying is a written update appropriate and, and try to provide you with pretty consistent written updates. You could use those written updates to say, mm -hmm. hmm, and, and, and we may even beat you to it and say, let's put it on. On a, on a higher up agenda type of thing, but you could also use those written updates to ask questions and, the, and, the, and, and maybe even to call yourself saying, I think we need to have more of a formal update. That could be a, a, an additional way that we could keep each other informed. Yeah, I, I think that's a great idea, Dan, if the, if the board would like that. The, the other uh, aspect of this, of course, is the annexation, and we're working very closely with the planning staff as well, so um, to try to be, to stay informed and, and figure out what the right ba balance is going to be for open space. Right. And we did find the item here. Um, it says OSMP and public work staff conduct a review and assessment of 30 percent, 60 percent, and 90 percent design plans to ensure that all open space concerns are getting addressed and returned to OSPT for their input at each stage, et cetera, et cetera. So that is one of our motions. Yeah, we want to stay actively involved and try and yep. be as ahead of all the legal implications of this process as possible. Right. Okay. Does that give you? Yeah, certainly. Yeah, we're meet and thank yeah. you for your suggestions yep. on yeah, what that should you. be. Um, are there any other matters from the board? I have some questions about the one of the attachments, the written report on community education outreach and volunteer update. Should I just go to staff and ask those, or uh, if how are we handling these additional? Uh, Mark, are you feeling feeling good? <laughs> well, we have Mark here, so. Yeah, you must be feeling good. <laughs> Come to life. It's only 825. <laughs> Can I do the camera for you? Um, I, I really appreciate seeing the, the diverse ways that the education and, and community engagement staff has been um, involving so many different members of our community in achieving the OSMP mission. Here, here. Um, and I especially liked seeing the reports on the number of volunteers participating in various things and the um, percent increases in people involved and so forth. Um, the, um, I, I really like the, the work to train volunteers and thereby enable OSMP to reach out to more people and have a broader uh, <laughs> outreach and community impact. Um, and I, I have two quick questions, and it wasn't totally clear to me as I read 
um, these two on what the expected takeaway of participants was and how it fit with the OSMP mission. So maybe I could just ask those two and, and you could uh, give me a, a quick response. Um, one is night hikes and one is making bow drills. They were highlighted in the report as, as some of the um, community engagement and outreach work. And I said to myself, hmm, I'd like to hear how those fit in with the OSMP mission. Right. <laughs> it's not directly obvious to me. Do you know, uh, can you point to which page they're on, Karen, just so we can go directly to them? I'm sure I circled them. <laughs> um, I know um, we've given, um, the night hikes has been, you know, similar to like the stargazing program. We've done that for quite a while, I believe. Um, I can get back to you with more detail on it, but it's been established for a fairly long while. And it's part of some of the things we do on the nighttime program. Um, Dave Sutherland's led most of those. And regarding the bow drills, we've been teaching sort of outdoor skills for a while now as well. And it's part of that program to give people greater confidence and understanding how to explore nature and be safe at the same time, and also teach kids some basic skills as part of sort of general approach to practices. But if you feel that uh, it's not appropriate, I'd be happy to follow what, up. What I'm wondering is what the message the participants take home with them, whether what they're learning is it's okay to go out on the system at night, it's okay to go into the system and chop down trees and make bow drills. I see where you're going. Uh, or, or what the message is. What is yeah. the takeaway, the desired takeaway? Uh, I see your point. It's a really good question. I, I'm happy to say that I know from working with Lisa's group for a while now that we always, you know, invoke the leave no trace message, best practices. And it's also part of the training for staff to talk about, obviously, the rules and regulations within open space and how we take care of it. So most of the trainings we have or programs we run include that. Uh, an example is, um, the Leave No Trace program is one of the big things we build in to all the types of work we do and all the programs we deliver. If you'd like more details on it, I can check back in with Lisa, and I know they have an update coming to the board in November, I believe, <coughs> so they could bring back more information then for you without me getting into the details of it, which I wouldn't fully be able to answer. Okay. Would that be okay to come yeah. back in November? Um, there are also, I'm just wondering uh, if there's probably some notification or advertisement on those two things that perhaps we could email yeah. out to as well if, if we still have that or something. Yeah, absolutely. <coughs> Thank you. Karen, I do know from experience as a Boy Scout that it's actually impossible to start a fire with a bow drill. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen and smoke and smell <laughs> smoke coming from them. I promise it's not part of the fire management plan. <laughs> All right. Okay. Anything else? Um, we're, okay, sounds like we're adjourned. We're adjourned. Right. Thank, you. Thank you. Short meeting. Live from Paris, on France 24.